Hello and welcome to the conversation. I'm Heil Russell. And I'm Cameron Regal. And this is a very special episode of the conversation. It's a spotlight episode. And we are putting the spotlight on a game where you can't even properly display spotlights. I am talking about... If, if you played this back in when it came out, you would need a spotlight to see it. <laughs> yeah, you, you would, you would uh, have to have one of those. Did they make the um, those book light things for the Game Boy yeah. Color? Yeah, the worm light. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. The days before the GBASP, they were... It was a dark age, and in <laughs> literally, every, yeah, every meaning of the term. No, uh, we're, we're talking about Donkey Kong Country today, and you might be thinking, how has DK Vines, the Conversation podcast, never done an, a spotlight episode about Donkey Kong Country? And you silly goose, you know I'm talking about the Game Boy Color version of Donkey Kong Country, the first of two remakes rare did for the snes original and this is a curiosity in the the canon in the library and obviously we're not doing this attached to any anniversary for the game you know it had we done a proper spotlight for this for its 20th anniversary it would have been back at the uh some sometime around 2020 when you, Cameron you and I were doing the spotlight series for Banjo Tooie and so there just wasn't time to do it then and, and I was like we'll we'll get around to it when we get around to it but I know we are approaching the 20th anniversary of the GBA remix the Game Boy Advance remake trilogy for Donkey Kong Country that cycle of 20th anniversary it kicks off next year in mid 2023 so i was like well now this year this season this is the time to properly go back and look at the first remake the one that stands by itself donkey kong country for game boy color and you know back in may of 1999 Nintendo released a game for their still then new Game Boy Color system, demonstrating the then mind blowing capabilities of the next gen handheld. And I am talking, of course, about Super Mario Brothers Deluxe. Um, <laughs> I mean, it seems silly now. It's it, it seems ludicrous even to say, "Oh yeah, it was quite impressive." to take the original Super Mario Brothers from 1985 and put it on the Game Boy. Uh, I mean, to have something on par visually with something that came out like 14 years beforehand, it might not sound like much in this day and age when we have the Switch and, you know, Steam Deck and, and handheld gaming is basically comparable with console gaming, but... In the year 2000, that was still a big fucking deal. I mean, look at the sprites of Mario and Luigi and the Goombas and the, the Koopa Troopas. They look just like they did back in 1985. And it's in the palm of my hand. This is incredible. Um, yeah, and they added like all these like nifty like framing features around it, like the Game Boy printer artwork and like the new menus and maps and yeah. like the challenge mode with with challenge modes with boo and yoshi yeah and especially coming off of like super mario 64 and that sort of era of mario and, and nintendo in general it was kind of exciting to see something like the original super mario brothers resurrected and, and it, like just a couple of years later i would have been sick of it because NES nostalgia, 80s nostalgia, Super Mario Brothers nostalgia itself would would sort of never go away after that. And it would kind of just smother everything else to the point of exhaustion. But in the year, two, in the year 1999, that is, it was still a novelty. It, it was still like, oh my god, this is so retro. And this, this is delightful. Uh, 
<laughs> but but that game, the existence of Super Mario Brothers Deluxe, it it kind of sticks out in my mind when we're discussing this game because I'm not quite clear exactly how it went down, but I can't help but wonder if Super Mario Brothers Deluxe didn't plant the idea Inception style in the mind of somebody at Rare. Because knowing how Rare never shied away from a challenge, even a self-imposed challenge, back in that era, I, I could imagine somebody, whether it be a stamper or, or somebody on the handheld team being like, oh, Nintendo's done a deluxe version of Super Mario Brothers. Oh, and they've, they've done this uh, enhanced version of Link's Awakening, both for the Game Boy Color. Well, let's instead do the most visually advanced Super Nintendo game on the Game Boy Color. Because we're rare and we can do fucking anything. <laughs> and so they decided to remake Donkey Kong Country. Again. Yeah, I'm very, very curious what the development background on this was <laughs> because I like, and this is going to sound like condescending, but I, I just don't know why um, right. this, this exists because right. like it's, I, I'm glad it exists. It's very, it's a very technically impressive, like downsized remake of Donkey Kong Country, but I'm trying to think what the the conversation must have been like internally at Rare that led to this existing, like, I mean, I don't know how the timelines line up, but I would assume by this point they kind of would have an inkling that the Game Boy Advance was coming. Nintendo tended to give Rare dev kits for their upcoming hardware. Oh, sure, and uh, the, the Game Boy like, Advance came like out a, in 2001 like i think it was it was was august 2001 somewhere around then so of, of course like rare knew it was coming um hell i mean they knew it was coming relatively quickly because at e3 2001 a topic you and i have discussed ad nauseum they had a whole slew of gba titles you know uh announced so I, I don't know if this was just rare high off their own supply, you know, coming off of their epic latter half of the 90s where, where they just could do no wrong. Yeah, I I also don't know if maybe it was meant to be, and I guess it would be sort of belated in this case, but like a companion handheld game to Donkey Kong 64. And this just happened to be the thing that made the most practical sense in, yeah. the, in the time frame. Yeah, well, so... And yeah. given what they were specifically doing, which was making it for a color system. Yeah. When you consider that, you know, DKC, you know, ignoring its sequels, DKC is essentially the most visually impressive Super Nintendo game, both both visually and, you know, the audio as well. And, and so they decided to take that, a game that was just six years old at the time of the release of this handheld version, and they they're like, all right, let let's do it for the Game Boy Color. Uh, you know, the Game Boy Color, not a handheld that is associated with Super Nintendo remakes. That would be the GBA. So, <laughs> so a, a lot was stacked against this game at the time of its release, and also from a historical basis. And because of that, it's sort of been forgotten about. Sans for hardcore Donkey Kong fans or those who are just at the right age when this came out, for this to be their Donkey Kong country. And when I say I had a lot stacked against it, uh, I, I speak from being there and remembering. Um, you know, it was released, obviously, at the absolute peak, the pinnacle of Pokemania, you know, uh, Pokemon had come out in the West in 1998. Um, and in fact, I got my Game Boy Color for my birthday uh, that year because that was the first November since 1994 where there had been no DKU or Donkey Kong related release that November. We had we had 
Donkey Kong Country in 94, DKC2 in 95, DKC3 in 96, Diddy Kong Racing in 97. We got Banjo-Kazooie in the summer of 98, but then there was nothing else that year. So for the first time, I couldn't just ask for the, the Donkey Kong game. So I asked for the Game Boy Color. Um, I, I went for broke. I was like, you know, um, if, if this is like one less, you know, if, if this lessens my Christmas gift uh, stockpile. I, I, it's worth it to have a color Game Boy. And um, with the Game Boy Color, I got Pokemon Red. Because I I also asked for Pokemon for Christmas that year, just because I was intrigued by it. Um, I had read in all the publications, you know, about how Pokemon was taking Japan, and I thought the, the concept of the game was intriguing. You know, collecting creatures and and training them and um it it seemed to be right up my alley obviously not as much up my alley as donkey kong would be but um so in the year 2000 this is when pokemon was completely still dominating the cultural landscape and so you release a game boy color game it, it's obviously going to just be overshadowed because everything about the Game Boy during this time was Pokemon. So, even I, you know, Mr. DKU, who, who had you know, co-founded DK Vine a year earlier, felt weird about pulling out my Pokemon cartridge from my Game Boy Color and putting in something else. It, it it was it just seemed unnatural because the Game Boy Color had by that point in 2000 solidified for me as just the the Pokemon machine. So it, you know there was that going on, but from a rare fandom perspective, from a DKU perspective, Donkey Kong Country GBC was released on the very same day as Banjo Tooie. <laughs> so I don't think we've yeah. ever had this circumstance after um where where yeah, especially from the like from rare right from from the <laughs> same studio and that studio being rare themselves so again at, at the year old dk vine it was hard for us to muster much enthusiasm for this obviously we were you know we we were all in for it but Banjo-Tooie was out the exact same day, so I would say 80% of our attention was going to Banjo-Tooie and trying to figure out, you know, how it connected back to Banjo-Kazooie, how you got those ice key, uh, you know, the, the real ice key, not that fake ice key you found in the cartridge, but obviously the real, real ice key back in Banjo-Kazooie, how you get that to Tooie. <laughs> And all those conspiracy theories that, you know, that dominated the cultural landscape of rare fandom, of DKU fandom in the uh, last month of the year 2000. Um, while, you know, the the Florida recount drama was going on, uh, Bush v. Gore or, you know, it just, oh, yeah, it, it's it's funny how, uh, looking back historically, I don't even associate that turning point in American history with uh, with the release of two Rare games on the same day. That, that was the bigger controversy for me back then. But, yeah, so Banjo-Tooie sort of, sort of drew all of our attention. And then the Game Boy Advance, the next gen leap of game boy hardware that came out less than a year later that came out i think yeah august of uh, 2001 so already yeah, this was a very quickly like outmoded game um yeah um I, i'll speak to some of my personal experience i ha i sometimes like forget that this game boy color port wasn't as big a deal to most people as it was for me when it came out <laughs> um because it, it did kind of hit at just the right time for me. Um, I had, I think, yet to get into the Banjo series or was just starting it around this time. Um, since I got an N64 late, I was like coming to the first game in Diddy Kong Racing. Um, and I have, I could not tell you why I was so enthused to get 
get Donkey Kong Country on my Game Boy, but I really was. Um, and I was really fond of this port. I remember keeping it in my Game Boy Color, taking it everywhere. Um, one very specific memory I have of it is um, uh, a re- shortly after it came out, I was involved in an ATV accident and broke my arm. Mm-hmm. And like I was like told, like you, you absolutely should not, not use this arm for anything. Only use your left hand for everything. And I'm like, well, that sucks. I can't play any games at all. <laughs> and I realized, well, if I hold my Game Boy Color a very awkward way, I can kind of sort of play Donkey Kong Country with one hand. So that's what I did. I played a huge chunk of Donkey Kong Country on Game Boy Color with one hand. <laughs> Until I got to slip slide ride where you have to like jump between two ropes over and over and then I just got stuck. <laughs> yeah. Playing Donkey Kong Country with one hand sounds like a euphemism. Yeah, it's something DK Vine has a different connotation with nowadays. Yeah, it's one of our random site no. slogans that pops up whenever you uh, load our site, if it loads yeah, at all. Um, here's, here's like a thing that like I'm sure makes no sense to anybody looking back at this. Like, like who, anybody who sees this on a timeline, like this probably won't make any sense. But I remember in the, the GBA game came out in 2003. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I remember seeing ads for it and I'm thinking to myself, well, I don't really need that. I have the Game Boy Color version. Why would I? <laughs> why would I? Why would I want the GBA game? Well, yeah, yeah. So the the GBA version came out two and a half years after this one did. So like, it, in a very short window of time, it was kind of outclassed. It, it, it was kind of uh, relegated to be forgotten. Because the the GBA remake was a huge, huge success. I think it hit at a time where it was able to have a bigger impact than the Game Boy Color version was. And in fact, as we've often said on this show, it was the success of the Game Boy Advance remake of Donkey Kong Country and the success of its two sequels that convinced Nintendo that Donkey Kong Country was actually what Donkey Kong needed to continue to be the the characters the the style the presentation like they they were trying everything for Donkey Kong during that time period but Rare's GBA handhelds were the most successful and they were like well all right this is what we're going to go in all in on and then that gave us Donkey Kong Country Returns and Tropical Freeze, and uh, the new theme park, and I'm sure whatever the new game is going to look like will draw heavily from it as well. So the GBA remake was a huge thing, but it also just totally eclipsed that this even existed. And it's a shame. It's a shame. Because, I mean, honestly, if I'm comparing the two, I sort of prefer this version of Donkey Kong Country. This is more interesting. Uh, It's... It's more, I, I think it has more new in it than GB, the GBA version did. And if I'm going to have to choose between any of the three versions, I'm obviously going to choose the Super Nintendo version. But if I want a slightly different experience, I'll be reaching for the Game Boy Color version. Yeah, I was kind of going to say the same thing. Like, as much as we've talked about, like, the GBA Donkey Kong Country, like, like making this obsolete, um, that's really only in terms of, like, you know, technical ability to mimic the Super Nintendo game. I think there is a lot that I like better about the Game Boy Color version. And I feel like it is kind of the the appeal in playing this version of the game has shifted in the timeline along with it. Because when it came out, it was, oh, it's a portable way to play Donkey Kong Country. And after the GBA, GBA game, it was, well, this is a less faithful way to play a portable Donkey Kong Country. And now when you can play the original Donkey Kong Country on 3DS, on Switch, um, 
or less Nintendo endorsed means. Um, there's not really a, you don't need a portable, do- a dedicated Donkey Kong Country portable port for the utility of it. Yeah. And instead, this gets to be, this gets to be a neat curiosity because of what it represents as a technical achievement, I think. Definitely, definitely. And also the different experiences it provides. It's, I, I, I think it's more beautiful in its own way because of all the warts and imperfections inherent in having a Game Boy Color version of Donkey Kong Country. It, it, it kind of reminds me, you've seen all of these bootleg versions of Donkey Kong Country for the NES like like these these very shoddy downgrades and this kind of reminds me of that but done well like like done to the most optimum ability to take Donkey Kong Country and put it in that format on that um in that like 8-bit style um, yeah i i popped back in the ge- into the game to prepare for this episode and i am kind of awestruck by what they were able to achieve with the Game Boy Color. Like I mean, the, there's a lot of like really like, like for lack of a, like a better explanation, just like the game blasting you with the screens with all this like color variety. Yeah, this, I mean, the, the, um, the vibrancy of the colors, I don't know how well it works with the concept of Donkey Kong Country, especially that original game, which was all about the, immersive experience of being in nature and you know to to have that um kind of drowned out by extreme blues and purples and yeah i i think it does work a little bit better than the gba game which kind of washes things out to the degree of looking like a watercolor painting yes yes like i said and and cameron i mean i you're younger than i am uh but we're both old in terms of the general internet and Nintendo fandom on the general internet. Um, So we can appreciate something like this, which is sort of a, a downgrade, a um, like a D make or, or whatever uh, of something that's more technical, technologically impressive. Um, I, I think we can appreciate it more because we are of the era this game came out in. And, you know, it, it's not just like, ew. <laughs> you know, it, it's like, oh, that's 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 cool. That's interesting. That's different. That's taking something I love and letting me view it in a new way. Um, yeah. So I, I don't know how much, you know, the youth would get out of this. But if you're really into Donkey Kong and you're more historically minded... I think you could find the beauty in this. Yeah, and it's it's a thing where um, there are pl- again there are plenty of ways to play the Super Nintendo Donkey Kong Country today. Like, there's no this doesn't need to be anybody's practical solution. But back in 1999, like, yeah, this was a perfectly valid way to play Donkey Kong Country. You're going to get the Donkey Kong Country experience out of it. Yeah, and when I did play it, you know, because I, I wasn't not looking forward to this game. Like, I, this was something that I was still, like, intrigued by. Uh, and, of course, I got it day one. I got it with Banjo-Tooie. Uh, I got Banjo-Tooie for my birthday. And I paid for Donkey Kong Country Game Boy Color with my own money. So, <laughs> it, 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 it was a complicated <laughs> birthday that year. But... Um, I, I got them both and when I, when I played, so I think the way I did this and my memory's a little hazy because of the way I went about this was I focused on beating Banjo-Tooie first. Um, I, I didn't try to do my, you know, file to, uh, actual canonical, uh, attempt at beating Donkey Kong Country for GBC, until I was done with Banjo Tooie, but I did play it while I was playing Banjo Tooie simultaneously. I did, you know, goof around in the game just to get a feel for it. So I would, 
not have it be collecting dust for however long it took me to be Tui. And when I put it in the put it in the system, when I turned it on, when I was greeted by the fanfare, and I you know was was in the Congo jungle, and I I was swept away by nostalgia. And I think that's the first time I may have ever felt nostalgia for Donkey Kong Country, where you know it was always this ever present thing for me from '94 to 2000, but to to experience it in that new way really did take me back six years into the past where I was younger and more innocent. And I was like, Oh wow. I remember these feelings. This is, so it, it was, it was cool. It, it, it did do what it was intended to do for me, the donkey on country veteran. And I, imagine it did a lot for the people who had never played the original Donkey Kong Country or never got to own the original Donkey Kong Country. If they like never had a Super Nintendo and, and, but they had played it either at a friend's house or whatever. I think, you know, this would have been just as magical for them to, to finally have Donkey Kong Country in a handheld form and, and get to, you know, take it anywhere with them. Yeah. It, Certainly, it just it, there was something just giddy about having DKC like really tiny in the palm of your hand. Yeah, yeah, and I mean that's sort of what Donkey Kong Land was was like back in '95. Obviously, Donkey Kong Land was a new game um, that just reused some archetypes and enemies and and, and whatever from Donkey Kong Country, but it w- it was a new experience, but. I remember in the summer of 95 playing Donkey Kong Land and taking it with me on family vacations and, you know, visiting relatives and it just, just having that magic on the go, uh, ha- having access to some of these characters and this world uh, was very special to me. And I think that's important to, to make that link because Donkey Kong Country for the Game Boy Color is essentially Donkey Kong Land 4. Um, at the very least, it's Donkey Kong Country reinterpreted through the lens of Donkey Kong Land. It's the DKL trilogy's framework recreating that original Super Nintendo game. And It is, and I... I think an extension of that is that honestly, if you played this game, it makes Donkey Kong Land harder to go back to. Yeah, it, because it, it's this more is tuned. the peak refinement of their like Donkey Kong Country game g- gameplay translated to the Game Boy. Yeah, for sure. It, it. I mean, Donkey Kong Land. I love it. I adore it. I think so highly of it. It is a very clunky game. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's rare second only Donkey Kong game. It's their first handheld game. They were really pushing the Game Boy to its limit and you know it, there are flaws. There are flaws, but it's especially noticeable when you play this game where they are able to replicate the original Donkey Kong Country so well in this form that it is so I, I I mean I think this is their I, I don't like to weigh it really against the Donkey Kong Land titles because I don't think it's fair because they had sort of a guide to work off. This is Donkey Kong Country levels and all, but it it is their most perfected Donkey Kong Land game essentially. Um, I'm I'm not counting the GBA remix. The, 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 and this is with several years of practice in addition yes. to having a roadmap. Yes. But like Donkey Kong Land, you've got one Kong on screen at a time. They teleport in like they do in Donkey Kong Land games. Um, It actually sticks with the animal buddy logic of Donkey Kong Land 2 and 3, in which you only ever transform into your animal buddies, and you never once ride them. The exception, of course, is Squawks, because Squawks has to appear with the Kongs for Torchlight Trouble to make any sense, and it barely makes any sense as it is. But um, <laughs> I be, because they're taking this, and I believe I saw it on Twitter that they did this 
uh, because it was too hard to have too many characters on the screen at a time. They were able to do it with Donkey Kong Land, but it it, it just became too much. So they decided you would only transform into the Animal Buddies in the original DKC in this version. But because the original DKC, you never once transformed to the Animal Buddies outside of those Animal Token mini games that everyone hates. Um, there were no no animal signs. The signs that you know says from this point on you can no longer be Rambi or you can no longer be in guard. There, there's none of that because you ne- you were never transformed into them. So I I think owing to that they tweaked the formula for transforming into them. Uh, you you transform into them, but now if you're hit by a baddie when you're an animal buddy, you instantly revert back to the Kong. Um, so you don't, you don't have that extra hit as Rambi or Espresso or Winky or whatever. And and you can't chase them down afterwards if you lose them, which I think makes some, uh, like parts of the game a lot harder. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it actually makes the animal buddies a harder concept than they were in the original Donkey Kong Country. There's no do overs if you lose them. And this change and and granted, you know there were very few areas where you needed the animal buddies in that original game. They were always an optional thing, maybe to find a, a secret passage yeah, or bonus. There's area. a there's a few places where you need them to find a bonus room. There there's also just a lot of them where you don't really need them for anything. They're just like a cool thing to have that can maybe make the level easier yeah. for you for a little bit. Yeah. So I I think this change in mechanic, the fact that if you get touched by a a Kremlin crew member once you go back to being a Kong. I think that's why visually they went with Donkey Kong 64's transformation crates instead of animal barrels. The the animal barrels from DKC2 onward don't appear in this game. You just kind of touch the crates and transform that way, similar to how they uh, portrayed it in Donkey Kong 64. So... I I I sort of love that. I, I at first I was like, why didn't they just use the uh, the established thing that transforms them? But I think they decided they would want to go with something visually different because if you had played a Donkey Kong Land game or if you are used to two and three, this this does not actually function the same way. So they they very subtly yeah, and, made it different. And the name of the game is. Like, make this seem like Donkey Kong Country for the people who played Donkey Kong Country and know Donkey Kong Country. You, I don't think you want to throw a visual curveball at them, even if it would make more sense with the established convention. Right, right. And luckily, Donkey Kong 64 already opened that illogical window of, of the the wider world of animal transformation crates. So they're, they're like, all right, it's, it's pre-established. Yeah. We can use it. It's yeah. fine. Speaking of tk64 this is kind of like planting the seeds that of the flower that i think that bloomed with dkc gba of like retroactively incorporating a lot of donkey kong 64's um elements and like the general vibe it applied to the donkey kong series back into donkey kong country for sure uh donkey 64 took the series into this broadly comic slapsticky sort of direction. Uh, I, I think mostly because George Andreas, you know, when, when he took over the project like that, 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 that was his sensibility. And so, yeah, granted there was cartoony slapstick in the original Donkey Kong country games. I mean, you, you step on a ledge as Donkey Kong and his eyes bug out, you know, Diddy and Dixie, they see a boss and they go, Wah! you know, that, that that was always a part of the series, but DK64 made it m- more silly. And I think after that point, Rare did sort of reincorporate that vibe into all of their subsequent Donkey Kong projects. And in fact, by the way Fate intervened, all of their subsequent Donkey Kong projects that were released were just remakes of, of it, past it- games. It certainly applied in the, the audio direction because so much of the GBA trilogy was pulling sound effects directly from D- DK64. But of course, uh, you only get that in this game in one instance, which I think we'll get to later. 
Yeah. Um, visually, uh, the game incorporates some things from Donkey Kong 64. Right away, you, you notice <laughs> the menu screen is Donkey Kong 64's menu screen with Donkey Kong holding a barrel up in the jungle sunset yeah, scene. It, it's really interesting, and I think it, like, clashes a bit with the rest of the game because I think it is just a downsampled title screen screenshot from DK64. Yeah. Yeah, it, it doesn't really match the renders or imagery of the original Donkey Kong Country at all. But it, it's kind of cool all the same. It, it really does make GKC GBC feel like Donkey Kong 64's Donkey Kong Land counterpart. And I know that seems nonsensical because this is just a remake of the first game, but it came out a year after DK64 and it did pull. And we're going to be getting into some of the different ways it does pull in elements from Donkey Kong 64, um, certain items, um, certain certain other things that didn't exist prior to DK64 that it, it that are like now part of Donkey Kong canon. And... Yeah, it it does make this game feel like the handheld counterpart to DK64 where, you know, uh someone who got Donkey Kong 64 and and played it and loved it, they could then play this game and and have it be sort of uh part of the same tapestry, a a piece of this the same sort yeah, of feeling. Yeah, I I, I can confirm as somebody who was super into Donkey Kong 64 and then went back to this and said, oh, they, they put the thing from the thing in the old thing. <laughs> <laughs> it, yeah, just checking in with the live stream really quick. We have noted Donkey Kong Country Game Boy Color fan just Andre in the uh, in the chat and just Andre is just chatting up a storm. Um, so it says one of the only things I'll say against DKC GBC, the meta textual thing where the intro plays the 8-bit DK arcade theme before being interrupted by the Donkey Kong Country theme doesn't land when the interrupting music is also 8-bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a few bits like that in, in, in um, in the GBC version where like, it's extremely technically impressive what they did, but it kind of, um, it, it kind of muddies the screw you old man humor from the original. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking particularly of like visiting cranky and he'll like still complain. Like my beard has too many animation frames. <laughs> and I'm thinking, d does it though? Yeah, th this should be the one <laughs> Donkey Kong Country game Cranky is completely comfortable being with. Espe like, especially when you consider Donkey Kong Land, like the whole plot, the the meta plot of Donkey Kong Land is, I bet you can't do that, what you just did uh, on the Super Nintendo on an 8-bit system uh, or whatever, you know, like this should still be very comfortable to cranky being on the game boy color but you know I'll, I'll allow it whatever um i'm sure cranky would find fault with uh, a system that could connect to a printer and and print out black and white images from the game um that's that's too newfangled for cranky kong but <laughs> yeah it's Visually, it, it it is interesting because you know it, it it's impressive visually, but I I think the limited color palette of the Game Boy Color sort of drowns out the ACM rendering. Um, like in some ways, I would say Donkey Kong Land is actually a bit more visually impressive than this because you can make out all of the details in the models and the, the, the 3d models of the characters where here, I... it, it reminds me of when you would go into like paint on your computer and just use the paint bucket and put it in images and it would just completely like wash it out with, with the colors 
I don't know. Yeah, I mean, there is a very, like, a very saturated, again, owing to the technical limitations of everything, everything is kind of very defined by defined by a single color, except in, in some of the backgrounds, they do some really neat stuff. Um, I would say it's kind of, there's a trade-off, I think, in a lot of the visual differences between this and Donkey Kong Land. Um, like, I'd say the most notable thing is... Um, the the character sprites in particular, mm. especially Donkey and Diddy, um, the ambition in terms of like um, number of animation frames and size is scaled back a little bit. Yeah, where in screenshots, I think Donkey Kong or like brief video, like I would look at Donkey Kong Land and think, yeah, that looks way better. This is kind of this is kind of scaled back a little bit, but uh, then you play Donkey Kong Land long enough to see the sprites jumble up on screen or um, see entire lines of like sprites start to flicker because th- there's too many objects making up your <laughs> playable Kong next to an enemy. And there's a sure. there's a little bit of sprite flicker sometimes in this port, but barely any surprisingly little considering yeah. the sheer amount of stuff on screen and how detailed it is and how many different like object color palettes they're cramming into a single screen. Yeah. And and I think, you know, the first Donkey Kong land, they went all in on like, Oh look, we could even do ACM on the game boy. And then people were like, I can't see the characters. I can't make out what's happening. It's, it's the, it's the Jurassic park. You, you you did it because you could you could not because you should right sort of so, where you have to you have to learn what works and then work back from there and I think they started to learn lessons as soon as Donkey Kong Land two where you start to see the backgrounds become a lot more muted oh yeah they they completely like stripped out the backgrounds in Land two and Land three adding only you know some visual identifier so you knew like oh that's supposed to be the ocean behind me oh yeah. that's supposed to be a, a mine behind me and, and as a result i do think they're easier to play but they look a lot less interesting than it's, donkey kong land yes one. and I, I i played donkey kong land the most on the super game boy so i didn't really have any problems and then when i played it back on my game boy i knew the levels well enough where i i just sort of you know, like knew where everything was. So I was remembering from the Super Game Boy. So that's how I worked my way around DKL's uh, just muddled mess uh, of visuals, which I adore. Again, you know, I just adore they did it because they could. Uh, Land 2 and Land 3 were far less interesting visually, but they were far more playable. And I think Donkey Kong Country for GBC, you know, builds it back then where it is not quite the jumbled mess that Donkey Kong Land was, but there's a whole lot more in the way of visuals, owing, I, of course, to it being a color system. Yeah, I think it's like the best of both worlds compromise. Yeah. Like that you hit on. They're still not as visually interesting as the original Donkey Kong Country, of course. Um, you know, there, there's far less detail in the backgrounds and the jungles. Or... And because these are all pre-existing archetypes, it's at a disadvantage next to Donkey Kong Land, which just has the appeal of being mostly original yeah yeah but it's still cool all the same to see them even attempt to do this on the game boy color i do think that donkey kong whenever he faces the screen like when he he's victorious in a bonus (laughs) level or whatever he looks like a demon like this, this we, we go on quite a bit about <laughs> how off Donkey Kong looks in various games, whether that be something like Mario Kart DS, um, where he's just got the permanent rictus grin or, you know, even even <laughs> things like Jungle Beat, where his fur is just way too overdone and he looks like, you know, he was had a blow dryer taken to his entire body. Uh, here, there's just something about his face that makes him look like he's possessed by some demonic creature. I mean, uh, part of that would be the DK and Diddy have to survive because this is an 8-bit game. They have to survive off of a color palette of only three colors. <laughs> so 
any white object is rendered the same color as their skin, which yep. gives DK like very bright pink eyes. Um, yeah. And I think part of what makes that like adds to that sort of demonic look you're talking about is I think they didn't just downsample Donkey Kong Country sprites, but also like redrew them in places to make the to make the detail play. Yeah. A bit more after they like, you know, like slightly redrawing his face so that it reads from whatever specific frame it needs to be. And I think in the front facing frames, well, you you got to have you got to make sure that his like eyebrow ridge is defined. And sometimes I think that would come at the expense of like his face will look a little bit weird, but you need it to read all the individual parts as Donkey Kong. Yeah, I think it's it's the problem with where whereas a character like Mario was created with all those limitations in mind and then he's kind of evolved, you know, as the years and technology progress. Uh Donkey Kong and Diddy Kong were created with the purpose of showing off what Rare could do in the Super Nintendo um with their silicon graphics workstations. <laughs> And and so to then have to downscale them, you're you're reducing them to a point they were never meant to be taken to. Yeah, there's a there's a really funny side effect with Diddy, which is again because he has the same problem with the same limitation Donkey Kong does, where his skin tone is bleeding into his eyes. Um, it makes him look like like Steamboat Willie era Mickey Mouse, <laughs> where the muzzle and the eyes are just merged into one shape. Now I'm wanting like a a Cuphead style Diddy Kong game. I don't know. That would be pretty cool. Um, yeah, it, it, but it, it kind of strengthens like, yeah, actually Diddy's design does harken back to the things it was inspired by. Yeah, yeah. Uh, these these are minor complaints. Like, I don't actually care. I, these are I more observations to me. Yeah, it's, it's like, charming. I find everything about this game charming. And it's not like it is with the GBA remake where it's just kind of deflating because it gets so close to the original game, but it just loses all of that immersion and moodiness because you have to wash out the palette because, you know, they, they they've made it too broadly cartoony in places. They've added sound effects and dialogue where there probably shouldn't have been. Uh, the- yeah, and both both games are also really hampered, and this is something that's also lost if you view them out of the context of their time. These were games made for a system, made for systems that were really freaking hard to see. Yeah. Yeah, I, I talked about the GBA SP. You know, the GBA remake of the of DKC was made before the SP was even a thing, before there was a built-in backlight to the Game Boy Advance. So they they had to compensate for that. And where it was frustrating with DKC GBA, I think DKC GBC is just more charming than anything. It's its visual downgrades don't detract from it because the product itself feels different enough it it doesn't get close enough to the original dkc experience where you're act- actively missing it you're instead charmed by what it can do instead yeah and there sense. are some it's interesting to see some of the things that they that they take out entirely or that they compromise on mm-hmm. like a lot of the a lot of the like levels that did some like special overlay trickery or have been scaled back or try a different solution. Um, like there's no, there's no rain and ropey rampage. There's no snow in snow barrel blast, yeah. or at least no falling snow, which honestly it makes the level a lot easier to play. Um, uh, and there, it, same with poison pond. It doesn't have the like mist effect, but there are a few that do have like, keep try to keep some semblance of the overlay effect um misty mine has the like this like steadily increasing like white overlay that like fades in and out as you play the level Uh uh-huh but uh the two biggest ones are due, due to the nature of again what we mentioned with the system being hard to see are torchlight torchlight trouble and blackout basement yeah yeah so 
I, I want to talk about Torchlight Trouble because <laughs> at, at this point, it's like, why why bother? Um, it, it's it's weird, and it's it's one of the only times in any Donkey Kong Country game where where I'm just like, I'm not even able to defend it. It's just, I guess they I guess they felt like they had to provide lip service to the it, original's gimmick. It feels like a concession to like, well, we we don't want to take Squawks out of the game. We don't want to take Squawks so. out of the game. We don't want to like really remove Torchlight Trouble at all. I, but- guess, I guess for context, since we haven't explained what Torchlight Trouble does, um, <laughs> in this version of Tr- Torchlight Trouble, when you break Squawks' crate, um, rather than him levitating to the or flying up to the up lo- upper corner of the screen and shining a like a spotlight cone on the screen in what is otherwise a very dark dim stage Mm -hmm. he flies up to the corner of the screen and just the entire level is lit from then on yeah he he's got a much more powerful uh lamp in this one (laughs) he's it's 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 uh I don't know. Uh, it's amazing how light bulb technology progressed in just six years, where it can just illuminate the entire cavern. And I don't know. Like, I, it almost, I almost wish they would have changed it up a bit instead of having Squawks right there. Like, maybe have it be so you have to find him. You have to like stumble around in the dark just a bit, and, and you you hide him. And I, I I get why they didn't do that, and why they felt like they couldn't do that. But it does render the entire point and purpose of Squawks and yeah. Torchlight Trouble meaningless. I, th- I do think Donkey Kong Country just ended up in a really unfortunate spot of having two level, two two or more levels that are based on lighting gimmicks, and ending up on two portable systems infamous for people having difficulty seeing. And you you don't want to you don't want to um, preserve the challenge and faithfulness at the expense of it being at all fair to the person playing it. Yeah. So I understand why they did what they did. Um, And another level that sort of in this vein is blackout basement. (laughs) And this is something I honestly don't even think I noticed until I played it on a system where it was easier to see. But um, the the conceit of Blackout Basement is every few seconds, the stage will just turn completely pitch black. You won't be able to see a single thing, but all of the enemies, hazards, objects, collision is still there. Um, In this version, it just dims the screen quite a lot. Mm-hmm. So if you're playing it on a device that is backlit or just have really good lighting conditions, I think it is the easiest version of Blackout Basement to play. Yeah. Even the even the Game Boy Advance version doesn't do this. Yeah, um, it, it's it's not so much blackout basement as just kind of brownout basement, like um, Emer- emergency generator basement. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it, it's a shame that you know you you really can't do more with it like i I don't even know if there would be a workaround like maybe the um i i like i'm thinking like was it was it super mario world that had the the stage where mario has a spotlight around him um or yeah thinking, yeah yeah I, like, I, I, I don't know if you could like futz with it and make it like work on the gbc and then the gba you know but it it is what it is you know you just kind of have to grin if if they had to concede i'm glad it was in the direction of making the levels easier yeah and and yeah you you do have to keep in mind you know people who have visual impairments who you you can't just completely like have the game be unplayable after that point for them you know you've got to you know sort of just oh well you know can't really do much about this but it 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 does kind of like make me laugh because for example like glimmer's galleon in dkl2 
um you know dkl2 they remade all of the stages like you you don't really have it, it, it's not so much a port or even a remake of dunk on country 2 it's just taking the ideas of dunk on country 2 and making new levels out of them but glimmer's galleon and dkl2 completely removed glimmer and just had light barrels instead so you touch the light barrel and everything lights up and um yeah i I imagine there was probably like an object limit concern reason for that but also i remember it like bothering me because glimmer is on the box oh oh yeah it's completely (laughs) false advertising and Honestly, we should have had a class action lawsuit going against Nintendo back in 1996 for all of the Glimmer fans out there who bought DKL2 <laughs> just on the promise of Glimmer. Uh, one of the few Animal Buddies who's made it on the box art of a game, along with Squawks and Guard and Rambi. I think that might be it. Because, um, yeah, Perry was cut off on the DKC3 box art on the render. He didn't make it on the actual box. So, yeah, Glimmer might be, like, in rarefied company, yet the game he appears on the box art of, he doesn't actually appear in. Well, uh, I know the Donkey Kong, the the Japanese Donkey Kong Country box, uh, Espresso, also yes, shows up. that's true, that's true, yeah. Oh, well. Uh, <laughs> Speaking of animal buddies in weird places, let's talk about the commercial for this game. And and we don't always talk about you know, ancillary media or promotion uh, when we do every Spotlight episode. Sometimes we do. In the big multi-part ones, we go through the whole build-up to the release and like, oh, I remember where I was on that cold winter night. Don't yeah, Adventure for the Game Boy I- Color really didn't have that because, again, it, it sort of... It, it didn't have nearly the amount of hype, you know, that a standard Donkey Kong Country release would have. But also, it came out on the same day as Banjo Tooie. As with everything we've talked about so far, the phrase like this is a this is a very this is a product of its time in that it's specific to like a very small window of one or two years where this would have made sense to do. I still don't understand how this commercial came about. So for those who've never seen it, you can pull this up on YouTube right now. It just, just type in Donkey Kong Country Game Boy Color commercial. It'll be the first thing that pops up. It is a commercial that, uh, this is part of the era of, of GBC advertising where they had the big Rocky Horror Picture Show lips. Uh, yeah, but, they had very consistent theming for all of their Game Boy Color commercials. Yeah. With this, like this get into it campaign. Yeah, where you had these creepy disembodied lips, they would say, get into it. <laughs> and they there would usually be this Game Boy Color, I, I think, at the, the center of some of these ads. Um, it, it was usually like a Game Boy Color, everything was in a white void. Mm-hmm. And like a character or something would be interacting with the Game Boy and things would go inside it. I think Mickey's Racing Adventure also had one of these. I don't think I've ever seen the commercial from any of the Mickey games that were made. I even know they got commercials. Oh my god. I'm, I might have just blocked them out of my memory. Uh, bl- blackout basement in my own head. But um, <laughs> this one... It used the Donkey Kong Country cartoon models of Donkey, Diddy, Crusha, and the general Clump version of Clump with the green skin and all. Uh, It used those four characters in this Get Into It commercial. However, they used the rendered fur that would often appear on Donkey and Diddy during this era, the the, the furry shenanigans. They they somehow put that fur over the cartoon models of Donkey and Diddy, and then Donkey rides in on Rambi at the end of the commercial and gores Clump, making this the only time. That Rambi the Rhinoceros has ever been associated with any of the cartoon versions 
of the Donkey Kong cast. So my question, Cameron, is how and why? How the hell did this commercial come to be? Because there's there's two possibilities that come to my mind. Nintendo outsourced this commercial to the cartoon people. I don't even know if the cartoon was still in production at this point or if they had, like, wrapped production. Or if the ad company was able to license the CG models from the cartoon studio. Yeah, like, normally I would just assume, like, oh, maybe the ad agency built their own models and they used the show as reference. But, no, they're really, really close. Um, The only thing that makes me think like maybe the TV show people didn't do it is because it does not look animated in the same way. No, like Donkey Kong is in this and Diddy is in this, but they don't because the TV show was made with mocap. They moved around like people. (laughs) Right. Um, And in this, they're walking around on all fours. Yeah. Yeah. I I was thinking rewatching this commercial uh, in the, build up to this episode and i was thinking wow you know i i i th- those models are instantly cringe for me because of my ill associations with the cartoon but i really like the way they're moving like, like there's something different where i could almost get behind a Duncan country cartoon of this is the way it felt um and rambi looks spot on to to his uh standard model like, like it's not like a, a retro studios like version of Rambi or how Rambi um, would appear in like uh, Donkey Kong Barrel Blast or where, where Rambi just slightly off model. Donkey Konga is, is like the most like horrific version of Rambi. But this looks like Rare's model of Rambi, but with the cartoon Donkey Kong riding on him, but with the furry shenanigans of Rare apply to cartoon donkey kong there's so many questions and we've never gotten any confirmation where this commercial came from like who was actually behind it how the cartoon models of the characters got roped into this it's a mystery yeah i again it's it's from the very narrow window where this made sense to do because the cartoon was Still, like, I think it was still airing on Fox Kids at this point. It was Fox Family Channel in the Fox, U.S. Fox Fa- yeah. Yeah, Fox Family Channel. Yeah, before it became ABC Family, before it became Freeform. Um, but, yeah, it, it was, like, it, around the era of the cartoon, still being actively on the air. So, I guess it made sense to tie into it. Like, hey, if you like the Dunk on Country cartoon, guess what? We now have a video game about it. But, like, they, Nintendo's never done that with any of their, like, licensed media from the 90s. Like, they never, like, used the Super Mario Brothers Super Show versions of Mario and Luigi to actually promote a game. They never used... Um, Bob Hoskins and John Leguizamo to uh, to promote, you know, uh, Mario Paint or or whatever. You know, it it's weird. It, yeah, and, it's but, weird. and past past this point, even when Nintendo did ad- adaptations, like if you did a Kirby ad based on the Kirby anime, it it's going to look like Kirby. Yeah, because the Kirby anime was on model. Right, right. So yeah, this is just interesting, and so like if. I'm not saying I am, but I'm saying if I were to be a hardcore fanatic about the Donkey Kong Country cartoon, where I, you know, I obsessed over it. That was my version of Donkey Kong. I hated the video games. I was all about the DKC cartoon and everything attached to it. I would view this cartoon as a canonical romp of my versions of Donkey and Diddy, and I would include Rambi as a canonical DKC cartoon character just because of this ad. But, um, yeah, uh, if, if anybody out there knows anything about the making of this commercial, please get in touch with us. I want to know. Uh, I, I, I would love to know more because it's kind of haunted me for over 20 years now. <laughs> I don't even think the like uh, the absurdity of it hit me when it aired. When I saw this commercial on TV, I I didn't stop and think that's that's the cartoon version of the characters. What's yeah? Going no, on? I 
I didn't internalize that until years later looking at the commercial on YouTube. I just thought like, oh, it's it's the Donkey Kong Country characters. I think especially because Clump and Crusha are on screen for a good portion of that. And they, I think, always had like truer vibes to their game counterparts than DK and Diddy did. Yeah. And DK and Diddy are more modified than them because of the rendered fur and the way they're moving around. Sure. Sure. And and Rambi being in there just completely, I think, severed the link to the cartoon because that, that was one of my biggest gripes when I was a kid. I was, was like, where are the animal buddies? Where, uh, uh, I, I can't, like the first thought I had when I saw that there was going to be a Donkey Kong Country cartoon airing was, oh, I can't wait to see them ride Rambi. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, that would have been an interesting day at the mocap studio. <laughs> hold on, hold on. Andre says, sorry, I haven't really been chatting. I was making this. And then there's a link on Twitter. What, what is this? Oh, OK. So it, it, it's it's <laughs> uh, oh, my God, it is. It is the uh, GBC model of Donkey Kong doing the see no evil hear no evil, speak no evil pose in his uh, taken from his victory celebration whenever he completes a bonus stage. But yes, uh, very evil indeed, Andre. And in fact, you will get a retweet and I will make the little like heart filled in. There you go. You know, that that second frame is like those photoshopped like faces. I see people meme of like the evil grin that's like, it says sus or something underneath of it. Yeah, we, we, we need to incorporate those as uh, emojis for the DK Vine Discord and our Twitch channel and the forum. Um, they, they weren't called emojis <laughs> back when we started the forum, but, you know, that's what they're called now. Um, anyway, uh, weird. Haunting. Yes, yes, that will stay with me. Uh, that will stay with me for some time. So thank you, Andre. We're not going to go through in typical spotlight fashion and go world to world to world because the worlds and the levels primarily are the same as the Super Nintendo game. We're going to focus on what's new here in this game. The new collectibles, the new level, singular, uh, some of the tweaks that are really worth talking about, and... I'm going to start with the sticker packs, which is, I had to look up, I always have to look up what these are called, because they were photographs in the Game Boy Advance version. I mean, they're they're not the same collectible, but the same idea, the same principle. Um, I I always associate them, oh yeah, they have photographs in the remake of Donkey Country and DKC2. I always forget how this works, too, because it's a lot less. There's an extra step involved than there is with the photos and the GBA remakes. There's an extra step, and it's not as an abundant hidden thing as you would expect. Like, I always mentally remember this as there is a sticker pack hidden in every level. And that's not the case. There is a sticker pack hidden in every world. That means there are six levels with this extra collectible. And to find them, you have to first find the green banana bunch somewhere on a stage. The green banana bunch, they they serve and act just like regular bananas, even though they're chunky colored. (laughs) <laughs> you can still collect them. Don't worry. They're normal bananas. But the green banana bunch is to signify to you, the player, that, hey, somewhere around here, there is hidden a sticker pack. A sticker pack. It's such a weird term, sticker pack. Um, It's kind of similar, I guess, to what Retro would do in their Donkey Kong Country games. When you utilize squawks, squawks would start squawking whenever there was a puzzle piece in the vicinity. Here, it's just a green banana bunch hidden, well, not even hidden, just put on the stage to let you know somewhere around here, there's a sticker pack. Yeah, I like the kind of vague signposting it does. Um, Kind of, honestly, kind of better signposting than a lot of the bonus rooms in DKC have. 
<laughs> oh um, yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> um <laughs> Yeah, DKC is a little bit inelegant, and I'm talking about the original team here. This is on you, Greg. This is on you, the, the, everyone. They, they were learning. They they fixed this problem in in two and <gasps> oh yeah, the two team in three. Yeah, well. yeah. They they uh yeah. I just finished replaying DKC two for my DK Vine yeah. done slow series on Twitch, and that that's like the, the thing is just how elegant the secrets in that game are in comparison to DKC one where DKC one, you get a little bit of this, like, let's just, it's supposed to be hard to find their secrets. And it, it reminds me a little bit of some of the more obnoxious hidden collectibles in ukulele where, where Kev Bayless is on record as saying like, Oh yeah, I like games to be hard. So I put this quill in a place that people would never look for it. It's like, well, yeah, but that's not really <laughs> what you're supposed to do. Um, but yeah, the uh, the sticker packs um, actually give a purpose finally for Donkey Kong's hand slap because the the green bananas show you that it's somewhere around here. There's a sticker pack buried in the ground. And you can get it one of two ways, with Donkey Kong's hand slap, or if you're with Diddy, falling from a high enough vantage point. Um, but the the hand slap maneuver is the Donkey Kong is blowing maneuver seen in Donkey Kong Country Returns of the original Donkey Kong Country, in that you very rarely use it. And I think it's only in there because Miyamoto suggested that it that it be in there. Um yeah, but, it seems like a, an idea that, like, by the time he suggested it, the game design's already cemented. You don't really have a purpose-bound function for it. Yeah, it, it just... It, I just love the symmetry, though, between Rare's first Donkey Kong game and Retro's first Donkey Kong game, and... and the the Kong, too little and too much. Yeah, Donkey Kong has this <laughs> superfluous move that you barely use, and it just, like, slows down the standard gameplay. But, you know, it, th- this does give it uh, a reason for existing for at least once. And, like I said, there there is only one sticker pack. I can't say that word without saying it in that uh, tone. Sticker pack. Sticker pack symphony. Uh, there, there's only <laughs> one per world. However, if you then put in the codes for no star barrels... Or and then no DK barrels, respectively. You can get twelve more sticker packs through throughout the game. That that they will put new sticker packs in different hidden locations uh, if you play through the game without uh, with, with one of those codes. Implemented. It's interesting going through some of the stuff you unlock because a lot of them these are these are these are images for you to print on your Game Boy printer. Like yeah. that is a huge side. Um, feature of this game and a lot of them are like promotional renders that we've seen time and time again for the original donkey kong country right but just like extremely downsampled and grayscaled to work with the printer it's it's so funny to see this because they were obviously like yeah you know what's what's the big Game Boy accessory we we can tie it into because it immediately dates whatever game does this like because Nintendo is notorious for just churning out these um, the, the these accessories and these add-ons that they quickly lose interest in. I think yeah. it's it's also because of like we've had such spotty preservation of this artwork there there's one that's like particularly standing out to me that you can unlock in the sticker book. Oh yeah. Which is, it's a Christmas themed render of with a Christmas tree topped with the rare logo and DK and Diddy in a sleigh being pulled by Rambi. Oh wow. Yeah. And I'm thinking like that has to exist in full color somewhere and we have never seen it. (laughs) That, that is, seems way too specific. So, I guess was that Rare's a uh, holiday card for 1994? I wonder. Maybe. Hold on, I I I just want to pull it up here. 
Which which page of this this sticker book is it found in? Um, it is. It's on the army page. Okay. All right, hold on. This this is something I'm going to have to share on social media after we uh, we finish this episode, despite it being April. You know. Um... <laughs> Wow, yeah, that's that's infuriating that we, that we have this taste of a render that's I don't I don't think have we ever seen this render in color in in it it's new to me if it's anywhere. I know I've seen rare do Christmas renders before including renders with the Kongs, but I this specific one is lost on me. Yeah. Okay, well, um yeah, that's that's uh, that's that's just f- it's just a funny too. Like, oh, I want to print out this black and white render of of <laughs> you know Donkey Kong Country when at this point in the game you could just print them off from online from Rare's <laughs> if DK website. DK Vine had a Patreon in 1999. This is what we'd be mailing out. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that's that's. It is of its time, and it's it's you you mentioned like how it's just such a very specific window, and that's what this feels like is this technology just that it's in there because it was something that Nintendo was selling and they could tie into it, but it was just kind of meaningless because more and more people were having online access at this point. You know those AOL however many free hour discs that were just, you know, drowning uh, nature at that point, uh, the environment, the ecosystem. So you you could easily just get on Rare's website. Uh, I, I don't think DK Vine had a dedicated, like, image gallery at that point. And I don't think DKC Atlas was around yet, but at least not in the same form it is today. So, yeah, I mean... But you could still find these images online, except for this yeah. holiday themed one. But though I always did appreciate this, um, like I never even had a Game Boy printer, but I always liked seeing Game Boy printer stuff in games because it would be this dedicated or art that they would put in. Um, especially um, the other big printer feature that was in this, which was the the alphabet oh yeah so the the infamous donkey kong country game boy color alphabet um and i say infamous because i feel like for a long period of time this is the thing from this game that persevered in the online discourse especially at dk vide this nonsensical alphabet that <laughs> I say nonsensical because you would think that uh, a Donkey Kong Country alphabet, each letter of the alphabet, would... If all of these letters had a tie-in to a Donkey Kong Country character, you would think they would try to match them up in some way. Like, A is for army. Um, G is for naughty. You know, you know N is for necky. C is for cranky, or F is for funky, R is for ram. You get the idea. <laughs> I don't need to keep going. But instead, you have the letter A, and it's being hugged by clump. And you're like, oh, okay, A is for, well, army. Like, clump is a is in an ar- the Kremlin army. Oh, okay, I guess I can see that. K rule is hiding behind the letter B. Well, B, I guess, is for, for boss, I guess. Um, Squidge, the jellyfish, is with C. <laughs> well, C, I guess Squidge like the, lives like in the, the sea. The ocean. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> C for Catwoman. Um, D is Croctopus. I, I, <laughs> I think that's where we run out of excuses. E is for Diddy, because he goes, e, e, e. Uh, F is for Rambi, because he'll fuck you up. <laughs> G is for Clambo, um, because there's gold in, in, inside Clambo. No, that's a pearl. Um, 
H is for funky because he's high. I is slipper because it kind of looks like a snake. J is Mankey Kong. Because he's, he's a grinning jackass. Yeah. K is for claptrap. Hey, we got one right. We <laughs> <laughs> L is for Donkey Kong because Cranky thinks he's a loser. M is for Squawks. I don't know. Because he's a, m- a macaw. <laughs> N is for espresso because there's no flight involved with ostriches. Uh, O is for zinger because, oh my God, bees. P is for naughty because another word for a beaver is a... Q is for winky. R is for... I think that's a... Is that a rock crock? It's a critter. Oh, shit. S is for uh, Candy Kong because uh, the sex appeal. She is hugging it. <laughs> She's like hugging amorously. it, and there are hearts like to signify like cartoon fornication, right? Uh, T is for Cranky Kong. I don't. I. I. I don't know. Uh, we teaching, I guess, because he's like pointing his cane at you. You. You is for Rock Croc. That's Rock Croc. Uh, V is Necky, Vulture. Okay, that makes sense. W is where Army shows up. Yeah, this ar- this drawing of Army really confused me as a kid because it's Army's most distinguishing feature is not Army's face. <laughs> and that's all you can... All you see is a face and a claw coming out of this W. Well, that's worth pointing out too because <laughs> these aren't your your stock renders that were already made. These seem to be hand drawn versions, or or at least new, new depictions of all of the characters. So th- yeah. th- this is all original artwork. So we get to see the DKC cast posed in a completely different way than we're used to. Yeah, this is. I was saving this till, till we got to the end, but this is why I love this alphabet because it is just all these original two D drawings of the Donkey Kong Country cast. Yeah, like which is he, something you wouldn't see again until King of Swing. Yeah, I was gonna say years before. I haven't really seen since, except for DK and Diddy. Years before Payon, I guess Rare did this first. But again, these are all monochromatic. We don't have color versions of this, despite it being the Game Boy Color. Uh, sorry, X is for Crusha. Y is is that uh, Chomps? Just standard Chomps. It's standard chomp, and then I think Z is Chomps Junior, and of course I I should also point out that there are numbers, and the numbers are attached to items and objects. Zero is the letter K. One is a uh, is, is a life balloon. Two is a DK barrel. Three is an oil drum. Four is two life balloons, which no, unless there are two green life balloons, which would give you four. Five is a bunch of bananas, which I guess halfway to ten. Six is the letter O. Seven is, I think, just a normal barrel. Eight is the letter N. Nine is the letter G because they realized they had to get all the letters in there. And then that was the end. Yeah, I I realize, like, in a vacuum, this looks like complete nonsense, like why the characters don't match up with their letters. Uh-huh. But I feel like I get why they did it, because, well, for one thing, you have two primary characters whose names both start with D. <laughs> and also, in the context of how this would be used, like, I think they were encouraging you to arrange these letters in sequence, so you'd get like a good care, like to spell a name or a word. And if you did, you'd get an interesting arrangement of characters. Sure. I, I never try to spell my own name with these. And apparently I eat to spell my first name. I am Funky, Chomps, Donkey Kong and Diddy Kong. So uh, aside from Chomps, I've got some heavy hitters in my name. Yeah, I think I've just got I've got a squidge, uh, clump, <laughs> squawks, diddy, critter, <laughs> zingers, 
and espresso. That's a that's an eclectic mix. Yeah, yeah. I'm just looking at how to spell DK Vine, and <laughs> uh, I think the only like the only heroic characters in DK Vine are Espresso and Diddy. At the end, the rest are baddies. We should just rebrand with these letters. Yeah, yeah. Why? Why go, go through all the effort <laughs> to have our own uh, iconography <laughs> when we could just. I- use these letters this is actually this is like the very specific fan brain rot i have uh i remember and i mean i would say i remember it still bugs me honestly um when retro when donkey Kong country returns came out they kind of had to they redid the country lettering in the title so that it matches the typography of the donkey kong portion of the title but there wasn't a frame of reference for some of the letters that are in the word country in the word Donkey Kong. So they kind of made up the shapes. Uh Uh-huh. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, no, you, you had a pre-existing font right here. Why doesn't this C look like (laughs) that C or why doesn't it look like the one, the Diddy Kong racing logo? Yeah. You you got it wrong. Uh, Gibbon. (laughs) Do it right. (laughs) Gibbon is in the live stream and, and is correcting us. Um, because we, we didn't point out that Q is for, winky queer icon so now you know uh thanks gibbon <laughs> I, I i love these letters like it, they're 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 an endless source of amusement for me and we we did use them in the aughts for different things we our brief attempt at having uh, our our own counterpart to wikipedia these, these were for fan wikis i think were a real thing we we attempted to get one off the ground for the DKU and and we were going to use these letters because it wasn't like structured like, you know, your your fan wikis today. It, it was it was a much more uh, rudimentary thing, but we thought we could like have each section kicked off by these letters. Um, eh, yeah, it, it's it's an amusing, again, artifact of the era, but m- moving away from the Game Boy printer. There were actually quite a few new features within the gameplay itself. And in fact, Funky and Candy Kong were each given new roles in this game. Uh, Candy much more so than Funky, because at this point, Funky's flights was still operational. And in fact, you didn't even access this new mini game from Funky's flights like you would in the later Game Boy Advance version. This was accessed through the bonus menu, and it's Funky Fishing. It, it's it's not um, possessive in this version. Funky's Fishing would be what it would be called in the GBA version. Here it's just Funky Fishing. And yeah, there and there's no real like established framing for this. You kind of just go straight into the mini game. Like you could even. I think there, somebody could probably make the argument this might have nothing to do with funky and it's just an adjective describing the game. I think we had those debates back in 2000 and it wasn't until the GBA version firmly put it to bed that uh, no, yeah, this, funky is running. this. Yeah, funky is running. it. This would be the first time that the notion that funky had operated a fishing boat rental service, possibly as his first business that he then used to, you know, Fund and finance his uh, his other uh, ventures like Funky, yeah, Funky really took a turn in this era between like the gun selling and fishing. Grant, <laughs> <laughs> I had to point out again the guns. I believe are supposed to be non lethal. You know, they're they're the. I know we all laugh about Donkey Kong whipping out the double barreled shotgun in the early footage that horrified Nintendo. But in the final game, I think the fruit weapons are supposed to be non-lethal. Funky isn't this this yeah. crazy arms dealer. I don't I don't know. He, he, he you say isn't isn't this crazy arms dealer and then I look over and he's miming machine gun noises <laughs> and thing and like explosions. All right now. All right. <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, but yeah, he's he's operating uh, a fishing boat rental service. Not very vegetarian friendly. Uh, this like it's funny because I remember being like, "Oh, I don't know how I feel about this." This was still like half a year before I became a vegetarian, uh, which you know uh, I've been a vegetarian now for over twenty years. Um, finally, almost completely vegan. I I still have problems cutting out cheese entirely from my diet, but. 
Um, I, I've avoided dairy in every other form. But, um, yeah, I was like, wow, you know, this is weird. Like, th- this idea that Donkey and Diddy, who were friends with this swordfish, would so actively be catching other fish. Wh- whatever. I, I guess it's muted a little bit by, one, you don't see them actually do anything with what they're catching. Yeah. They could be throwing it back off screen. And... Two, everything they're catching is an enemy. That is true, yes. Um, I I think there's the... Again, this is from the GBA version, but there is original artwork that you can find, unlock in the this photo albums in the GBA remake. There are original rendered scenes for Funky's Fishing and Candy's Dance Studio. And in the Funky's Fishing one, Donkey has a big bag full of fish on the fishing boat. <laughs> <laughs> so also staring directly into the camera like uh-huh. you caught him in the act yeah but um yeah so i mean i think it makes sense i like this retcon that funky before he had the uh airline before he you know branched out to funky's rentals in the northern hemisphere and had a gyrocopter and before he started making like fruit-based weaponry and he became like this technological entrepreneur he just had this humble fishing boat rentals oh yeah Mm. here here's my wooden fishing boat and this is where he slowly built his empire it makes sense this this connects some dots back to even dkc3 with the the motorboat and the hovercraft and the yeah so i i like that it's there it's it's again kind of separated from everything else in this game it's just on the bonus menu and i forget that because the gba version looms so large in my mind and their uh funky's fishing was the primary draw you know you you went in you went inside funky's flights but i think it was branded as funky's fishing in that game and um you had the two options mm-hmm. there, but yeah, this this was a, a fun little addition. It, it was kind of uh, ancillary here. Um, it, it was just oh, if you've if you've played the original Donkey Kong Country, if you're an old ha- hand at the series, we've got some new stuff in here too to make it enticing for you to pick this game up. And I think that was mm-hmm. primarily the point uh, of having funky fishing. Gibbon chiming in in the chat to say superior version of the mini game. Like uh, vis-a-vis the GBA version, and yeah, I th- I think I agree. I like this version of Funky Fishing better. What sets this one apart from the GBA version? I'm not mind? even really sure why. I think it might honestly even just be the more low key presentation, and that you have less screen real estate to work with, so yeah. it's more focused. Yeah. I I so in the the GBA version I do appreciate because you access it from every world from the from Funkies uh in the GBA version and I I appreciate how they do this weird attempt at making it fit each world despite the fact that it takes place off the coast of Donkey Kong Island on each one so uh like for example in Gorilla Glacier I think they have like icebergs or something in the water i know in creme croc they have like discarded factory equipment in the water and so it's just like is stuff falling off from donkey kong island while you're fishing off the coast um here it's just uh, a much more straightforward scene i think it's just the donkey kong island at sunset and you're fishing it's also a fun little like this is the interjection of original content into this game. There's like a fun little hand drawn Donkey Kong Island in the background. Yeah. And this is where the uh, heavily compressed DK 64 voice samples come in. Oh yes. Grant Kirkhope's time to shine in the original Donkey Kong country. Is, I guess this, yeah. was this the first time that those voice samples were used in a game that wasn't DK64? Because it would be quite ubiquitous up until uh, a f- couple years after the buyout, they stopped using Grant's uh, voice samples. Yeah, it was Power Tennis that was the like first tapering off point 
of them using the old clips. So I think this is probably the earliest use. Yeah, because I don't think it was anywhere on the N64 other than DK64. They still use the um, the kind of the carburetor sort of uh, stock Hollywood uh, sound effect. It's actually of a chimpanzee. Um, the woo, 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 you yeah, know. I don't think it would have made it into like the shared Nintendo asset library by the time the remainder of the N64 games were coming out. It was honestly probably added to the shared Nintendo asset library at post buyout when they got all the rare assets. And that's that's when they started using it, which would make sense. Um, but yeah, yeah, I, I like I, I mean, I, I, I will always love grants donkey kong you know i i i have problems with donkey kong 64 but grants donkey kong has never been one of them i love his portrayal of, of dk it is the iconic dk in my mind and so it's always great to see it applied elsewhere yeah same it 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 just got the the perfect like vibe applied to what i think of when i think of donkey kong right um Candy's Challenge is another new mini game. And this one, well, it would be the first attempt at giving Candy something else to do since saving <laughs> what was like post DK64 or starting with DK64, you could save anywhere. Saving was, was it automatic in this game or did you have to like physically go through the trouble it's, of selecting save? It's automatic, which I think messes me up in the Game Boy Advance version because I th- I think there might be a mix of auto saving and also saving from the menu. Yeah. But um, yeah, it just auto saves in the background constantly in in the GBC version. Yeah, the which G- honestly made me nervous whenever I'd like quit it. Like, y- you sure it's going <laughs> to save what I just did? Right. I- I've been there. The GB version of Conker's Pocket Tales is the last rare game to utilize save points um after that you know they brought saving into the 21st century and so in this game they're like well they they could have just had save points they could have just kept that facade from the original game intact and i don't think anybody would have minded i i'm glad they didn't um for one for one um there are parts in the game in the original game where I don't like that you have the save point, um, like um, the beginning of Gorilla Glacier, where you have to go through an entire gauntlet of levels before you reach it. Right. They're, they're... But also just because this was a portable game, you're going to have a lot more instances of a kid being told like, okay, put that down. Yeah, that, that, that is true. Yeah. Um, I mean, I like the strategy that goes into the save points in the early dog on country games um, where, okay. So I have, I have to figure out like I stock up on lives here cause I I'm a long way off to get to candy or maybe I can get to funky and then go back and save in an earlier world. Yeah, I need, need, need at least 30 for snow barrel blast. If I don't take the shortcut, <laughs> but yeah, candy's challenge was the first rough draft at figuring out what candy's role could be in in a post saving world and yeah i think this is kind of the most half-baked area of this game i think they would hit upon something a little bit better in the game boy advance remake with candy's dance studio one it was just thematically tied to the character of candy like okay she operates a dance studio that makes sense given she's also you know into music in dunk on 64 um candy's challenge is sort of nothing um they they rebrand the save point as the challenge shack candy calls it the challenge shack (laughs) come to my challenge shack what the hell is a challenge shack they also replace the save barrel with a spin barrel which is just a a blast barrel um and, and all this is is just taking the bonus levels of the original Donkey Kong Country, uh, or or maybe even in some cases Donkey Kong Land, and then taking the concept that DKC two introduced of having an exclusive prize a- as your goal in these bonus areas, 
Um, so instead of a creme coin, though, or a bonus coin, it was a banana coin. A one banana coin. The only time a banana coin actually appears during the entire iteration or any iteration of the original Donkey Kong Country, right? Like, I don't think banana coins appeared in the GBA remake. I don't think so. So the, these are banana coins um, and, and you can get six of them, <laughs> which seems hilarious to me because banana coins are just such this such a abundant collectible especially once you get to the retro games where you you will usually have 999 banana coins by the time you get to uh the final boss but what do the banana coins actually do in this game i know you collect them but do they have any payoff other than look i've got six banana coins yeah i i honestly couldn't remember i didn't know if like maybe they unlocked like the additional bonus levels but like like you know like the levels in crosshair cranky or such but i looked at i tried to look up documentation for it i can't find any documentation of them doing anything i know and, i know you can see how many you've collected from from the the, the right menu. like they show up on a dedicated menu screen just saying saying like hey you did this this is a this is a little marker hey good for you right um but i guess i think part of why i don't know what these do and i'm like so insecure about being certain that they do don't do anything is the challenge candy's challenges are so forgettable to me as part of this (laughs) game because the game actively makes it hard for you to remember because you can do them exactly once and then never again yeah It would be one thing if you could just replay them for fun, but you go, you revisit Candy. Like, you know you've completed it if the Candy's Challenge text on the map screen is red. And then you know, I've beaten it. And 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 you you visit her. You go there, Candy will just shoo you away and say you did this already. Yeah, yeah. And (laughs) and so that's it. And it's like, well, okay. So yeah, you, you play it once, and then you're done. And... I don't know. It's it just, it, like I said, it just feels half-baked. Like, they added these it's, six extra bonus areas via candy. It, it's a little inelegant. I think, I think a, like, a replayable minigame, something similar to Swanky Sideshow, would have been a bit more meaty. Yeah. And been, had more incentive to revisit it. And I do genuinely, I do think the GBA version knocked it out of the park on this one, giving giving her a dance studio instead it fits with her character it gives her a reason to have a stage as part of her backdrop still yeah like, and like also it, it just fun silly animations of all of them dancing like i said poor candy like she 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 is the kong who has struggled the most to find her purpose and, and what her character actually is like and i think that's why she's always kind of been cast aside like funky you knew exactly what he was about and what he did you knew everything you need to know about him from the moment you introduced him so from that point on you would only add more and more nuance as as he developed same with cranky candy donkey kong's girlfriend runs a save point well, a save point isn't an occupation. It's not something, it's not a career. It's not something that people wrap their identity around. A save point. Um, she, she, she was almost too metatextual for her own good. And then Donkey Kong 64 is the first time she was ever identified with anything other than being Donkey Kong's girlfriend. And it wasn't until the GBA remake where you really feel like you could sort of see her exist independently of the games themselves like i i I can imagine what cranky and funky would get up to when i turn off my game candy i have no idea and it wasn't until the gba remake where i was like okay Mm -hmm. i i sort of get it now but before we move on i have a question about these banana coins cameron i want to ask you the uh the artist amongst us the banana coins are a different design in this game. The front of them is still the banana bunch as seen in the other rare games that feature them. 
However, the back, there, there's a different backing to the banana coins in this game than there, there have been in any other game. And it's a, it's a symbol. And I'm wondering what the hell this symbol is. It's not exactly the nuclear symbol, but it's close. It's, it's weird. I have no idea what this thing is. I, my thought was like, because there's so many things that isn't quite, <laughs> it isn't, it isn't quite the nuclear symbol. It isn't quite the like crosshair from crosshair cranky. Yeah. And the thing I think it would be most likely to be is a peace sign. Like, which is, was also of some debate in the, like in super Mario brothers. Like what is, what, why, why is Mario taking down a peace sign flag? People didn't realize it was supposed to be a skull. <laughs> um, but even that, it like if it were a peace sign, it should have like a couple more pixels down angled. I would think I did. Like I feel like that would be okay for candy, but so I I'm if completely it's not sp- that. I have no idea what this is. I'm completely spacing here. Did getting all six banana coins unlock Crosshair Cranky? Well, no, Crosshair Cranky is there. Okay, but I didn't know if. I couldn't remember if the levels in Crosshair Cranky were unlocked just by progressing through Crosshair Cranky or if they unlocked as you played the game. Okay. Uh, but I think that it's independent. I think it's independent of these coins. Cause, because having the Crosshair symbol on the back would make everything make sense if that was the case. But, it, but it's not. But even so, it, it's not exactly the Crosshair symbol. It, it almost looks like a... It reminds me of like a shy guy face or or Fanto from Super Mario Brothers Two. It is like vaguely like a yeah, I could see like a screaming face in this or a frown, a a, a, a screaming sad face. Like what the hell is Candy's challenge? Well, this is this, <laughs> I'm I'm so depressed that this is where we are. Like, that this, this is, is where, where we banana. This coins. is where like Candy has sealed the souls of her victims. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're so upset that their <laughs> banana coins are are stuck in this one random, almost meaningless game in the DKC GBC remake. But obviously, before we move on to Crosshair Cranky, I, I want to talk about the new level in this game. The thing that most people talk about when they talk about the positive attributes of DKC GBC. And it's Necky Nutmare. It, it it's a new level in Chimp Caverns, exclusive to this version and this version alone, wedged between Misty Mine and Loopy Lights. Necky Nutmare, and my questions before we actually discuss it, or I guess, or I guess, kicking off our discussion of it, why does this exist? Was it planned for the original DKC and dropped? Did it exist in copious post-it note form and the GBC team decided to actually make it for real? Why only one new level and a cavern level at that? You could have done anything. What? Yeah, I have no idea. And I have a lot of those same questions. Like my first instinct would be to think, well, maybe the GBC team made a new level because they could, and it would be like an extra thing to, to you know, to for for this game to promote. But and maybe they maybe they could have done more in the future, and you know, time didn't permit. And I guess if you're going to add a level somewhere in the game, Chimp Caverns makes sense. It's kind of like the the light, the very light back half of the game. Um, yeah. where all, all the ar- all the archetypes are starting to repeat. Um, but I think because it's in Chimp Caverns and because it's a cave level using existing assets, like there, this isn't like um, what the what the handheld team would eventually do in Pacifica, where it's like a heavily remixed version of an existing archetype. Yeah, it, it is. It is just another cave level in. The world in DKC that is infamous for being full of cave war levels, or at least like dark and dreary levels. 
back to back, which I guess is also probably if they're going to put it in Chim Caverns, it's probably also why it couldn't be like a any other archetype other than a cave, a mine or a walkway contextually, Mm -hmm. even though that's less fun. Um, Revisiting it, I feel like it's a it's a level that doesn't seem like out of place for a DKC level. And I think the, if I had to like nail down a gimmick for it, in addition to just being full of mini neckies, it gets a lot of one thing. It, one thing it kind of does to like tap into untapped potential of the original game is it makes heavy use of the gray crusher from the original game. Yeah. Um, which I guess in this game kind of does like a weird palette flip. The gray crushes are actually more blue than the normal crushes you run into. Um, but yeah, for those who don't remember, the gray crushes are invulnerable to anything except a barrel. Donkey Kong can't even jump on them. And there's like less than a handful of them in the original DKC. And they're all over Necky Nutmare. Which I like. I, I like those crushes. Those crushes were always so intimidating, especially, you know, towards the end when they would be, you know, positioned on only like one platform you had to jump on and you needed to use a barrel or else you were screwed. Um, yeah, it, it just, it's just weird to me. Like knowing what we know about Chimp Caverns in development, like originally the team wanted the it, it to be more of a lava interior like um volcanic in core of Donkong Island um which they would allude to time and again throughout subsequent Donkey Kong games like mm-hmm. Donkey Kong 64 you would see some of the volcanic interior you know going into crystal caves and uh they would suggest the lava creeping through on the map of chimp caverns in the gba remake and then of course retro would finally take us all the way there by having the volcano erupt in the tiki tech tribe yeah. etc yeah on that note like I, I do really like the additional volcan volcanic like red haze of chimp caverns in the gba game but another question about necky nutmare is why did it never come back yeah in the GBA game. Yeah, well, like, why does it exist? Why is this it? Why is this the only new level? Why is it in Chimp Caverns? Why didn't they, like, do something new with it? Like, or, or you know, put in a new archetype just for the hell of it? Or, or like, be- if, if the original game was limited and Chimp Caverns was what it was because of a lack of time, why not do more with it? Um, and then why never bring it back in the GBA remake? So many questions around Necky Nutmare. It's just this anomaly that that exists, and we don't know why. I remember Rare's website would would like talk about like, oh, it's going to have a new level, and you're like, oh, oh, Donkey Kong Country for Game Boy Color is going to have a new level. And it's it, it's just just a kind of standard run of the middle level. I'm not like dismissing it. It's still really cool that it exists. It's still a kind of a treat, a, a little extra thing. But when I think of a new level, I'm thinking something you get for f- finally getting 101 percent in the game. You like a finally unlockable something more along the lines of the Golden Temple stage from DKC Returns. You know, something that's a little bit more out there. Something that's a little bit more worth it. Maybe something you can unlock. Instead, this is just something you encounter through normal gameplay. Yeah, and if you uh, never played the original version of uh, of Donkey Kong Country for the Super Nintendo, you would never know this was never not in the game. It's just, yeah. it's just there. And and there's something to be said for it being seamless, which a lot of the extra con- a lot of the extra content in Donkey Kong Country games added in subsequent releases historically has not been. Yeah, that's it's true. It's generally been really easy to spot the seams where new content was grafted on. This one, not so much. It blends in really well with all the pre-existing um, like elements of Chimp Caverns, but that also keeps it from standing out by the same token. 
I I would have liked to have seen it come back in the GBA remake, but honestly, there's something charming about this forgotten version of Donkey Kong Country having the exclusive level. It, yeah. I mean, and it, a running theme with this game is just we have a lot of unanswered questions. Yeah, I, I guess that's true, and it's it's from an era that's kind of hard to get answers for, like. So so much about the development of the first three Donkey Kong Country games, even the Donkey Kong Land games, um, they're kind of on historical record now. It's been talked about. This version has not really been talked about much, and part partially because it was so quickly displaced by a technologically superior remake, if not an actual actually superior remake. Um, but certainly one that the broader a, re- a remake populace. on more technically capable hardware. Yeah, c- certain certainly one that commercially would be a a more viable remake that would stick with people. Um Winky's Walkway, while not a new level, has also been slightly expanded in this version. Expand Winky. Um this was something that had to be pointed out to me because I genuinely did not even notice playing. I knew this, and I, I forget that this was the case quite often. And I don't know why they did this other than, yeah, the original Winky's Walkway is absurdly short. Uh, like, o- almost shockingly short. It's barely a stage at all. So I can see maybe they were thinking, hey, let's let's add more to this because this this level kind of sucks. Yeah, I, I wonder if it was just simply because, well, we need to give Winky more to do. Yeah, I could see you, that. You, give, you get a bit more time with Winky this way. Yeah, it's... it's Especially in their introduction where you kind of have to wrap your head around his unique controls, which I don't know if it's just... This may not even be true necessarily. It might just be I'm like more used to it, but I feel like Winky was easier to control for me in this game than in DKC1 prop, like Super Nintendo. I don't know if that's just like the le- less visual awkwardness because it's just Winky by himself or like adjustments to the to his movement because of the smaller screen. I, I don't really, I can't explain it, but I just had an easier time with Winky playing this version of the game. Hmm. I don't know. It I, I do remember one of the highlights of playing this game back when it came out was, oh, I get to play as Winky again. Because because Winky was was this like great lost animal buddy who, who was sort of revered even more back then than he is today, where you know he he was not in Donkey Kong Land, Express it was, and then he was replaced by Radley in DKC2. So we got one game with Winky before he was relegated to a background role in DKC2 and then not seen again. So it, it was it was special for us to get to play as Winky again and to a lesser extent I, Espresso. I also admire the dedication of whoever had to had to squeeze like a camouflage patterned frog onto <laughs> yes. 8-bit graphics and make it look at all readable. He and the look, sprite is readable. It looks very good. He looks good. Yeah, you know exactly what he's supposed to be, which is it's not an easy challenge. Speaking of challenges, uh, the the other new mode, because Funky got a named mode, Candy got her new mode in game, Cranky got something that I think was just named after him. It doesn't really have much association with Cranky, other than I guess. You you could read into that Cranky is egging you on to do this. Crosshair. I guess it Cranky. also gives all three of the Kong something to their name, though. Honestly, you could kind of swap Cranky and Funky's names for these mini games, and it would make just as much sense. Right, uh, except you need to keep the alliteration somehow, so it it would have to be mm. like, yeah, mm. Funky's firearms and Cranky's. <laughs> Cranky's catch. Uh, yeah, Cranky's catch. Yeah. Crosshair Cranky. Th- this is interesting to me because it takes place on the map screen of Donkey Kong Island, but it moves everything to the left. It takes place on offshore 
islets just off the coast of, of what would be established as the Congo Beach. Uh, and Crosshair Cranky is an extra mode that, that's not ac- accessed within your save file, but um, just, just it's, it's like funky fishing. It's accessed through the menu. But in my mind, it almost serves as an epilogue to the game because it takes place on the map screen, but a different portion of the map screen than we've ever seen. And, and I, I love that you, you bounce around these offshore islets, which is always one of my favorite things whenever they introduce like this new little thing off the coast I, of Hong Kong Island. I always love when there's an implication that something was there the entire time and you just didn't see it because the screen real estate cut off there. Yep. Yep. Um, and, and this like, ties in with you know the banana fairy island and Donkey Kong 64 and if you if you accept our assertion that the Donkey Kong land worlds are mostly offshore islets um then you know you've you've got all of this like expansive real estate of Donkey Kong Island beyond just the main island so you could you could potentially have unlimited worlds in future games that take place on Donkey Kong Island, just not on the main island. But Crosshair Cranky, there are... Is it six? Five? How, um, I, I think six different stages, maybe, um, that um, you, you use the coconut gun from off of Donkey Kong 64... And you use them to shoot Kremlins, essentially, um, among yeah. other things. And there's no preamble to this. You just know it's the coconut gun because you have a reload icon in the center of the screen with a coconut. Yeah. And um, it, it's similar to the Donkey Kong 64 bonus stages where you have the watermelons that you, you reload in the middle with the, the watermelon icon. Um, but it's it's weird that, you know, that game used the watermelons and not any of their own guns in, in the game. Um, yeah, I guess it had to be, like, agnostic to whichever Kong got in it, even though all the bonus rooms are tied to a specific Kong. Yeah. Uh, I remember these being pretty fun. Um, th- these are pretty elegant little games um, that... There, there are six. So Kremlins and Kongs was the first one, and it took place on a little temple environment. And the critters would show up and try to steal bananas. And then Donkey and Diddy would also jump out and stand on the bananas. So you have to fire at the critters to keep them from stealing the bananas, but if you, then you couldn't hit the Kongs. Which always made me question, well, I thought Donkey Kong was the one firing the coconut gun because he's got the little icon in the corner of the screen. But then what's Donkey Kong doing on the stage itself? Is is he like, it, does he have the coconut gun on like automatic fire and then he's running out? What's happening here? Is Cranky firing it? That's what you think. But then why is the icon Donkey Kong? I, I And Donkey Kong is associated oh, with the Oh, yeah, that's, that's true. The icon. Yeah, the game had, like, all of these games have a, like, Donkey Kong happiness meter in the bottom left corner of the screen that kind of functions like your, like, like, Doom Guy health indicator yeah. for how well you're doing in the in the mini game. I don't know. Like, uh, getting getting progressively sadder the worse you do until eventually you, it, it, you lose the mini game if you get them too upset. Maybe it's a Donkey Kong hologram that's running out. I, I, I... Barrel O Kremlins. I think this is my favorite. Barrel O Kremlins takes place on a like fishing pier just out, out at sea, um, it, off the coast of the island. And yeah, I have very different associations with a pier full of barrels now, thanks to Sea of Thieves. <laughs> <laughs> um and and this is basically like shooting fish in a barrel except they're they're critters in a barrel and they they pop out and you, you've got to uh you got to fire your coconut guns when they pop out and you've got to uh get like a hundred points with i think they they have the points based on the color of critter so 
green are worth one, blue are worth two, and red are worth five, which is not the traditional uh, color numerical values in a Donkey Kong yeah, that's game. Yeah, that's not the hierarchy, I know. No. Uh, but th- this is very similar to Kremlin Kosh, one of the Donkey Kong 64 bonus stages. So um, why they didn't just call it Kremlin Kosh then? Whatever. Um, Kremlin Crackdown is... It just it just takes place in a jungle. It's similar to Kremlins and Kongs, except I don't think the Kongs are No, the Kongs don't appear. I think the Kremlings just appear more frequently. Yeah. And they they try to steal the bananas, you've got to fire at the Kremlings, et cetera, et cetera. Buddies Beware, uh I this is my second favorite one, where you've got the animal buddies, uh well specifically Rambi, Espresso, and Winky. They're being chased by large naughties. Um, not not necessarily like very naughty and really naughty, but just like the big naughties you would see in Donkey Kong 64. You know, just, just larger than average naughties. They're being chased by the naughties in this jungle environment, and there are holes in the ground. There, there are three different paths, and there are holes in the ground, like the top path, and then they run to it's- the middle path. And it's set up box. very similarly to the Game & Watch game Manhole. Yes, yes, that's exactly what it is. And so you've got to plug the holes with your coconuts. you got to fire your coconut gun into the holes and make it accessible for your animal buddy. And they pass over the coconut and then the coconut falls through. So, you know, they can only traverse traverse over it once. But you've got to get your animal buddies to safety, which is a great motivator for any Donkey Kong fan, right? The the protection of your beloved animal buddies. Rare knew how much we loved them even back then. I, I just wish that Nintendo and Retro and everyone else since then would recognize how important animal buddies are to any Donkey Kong fan. Oh, geez, somebody needs to check those holes for Espresso and Winky. Maybe <laughs> that's why we in? hadn't seen them. They fell in. Oh, no. Oh, they've been in there all this time drinking rainwater and, and having to, like, survive on any insects that fell in. Wanted uh, takes place in a, a mine, and it's it's basically Barrel of Kremlins, except um, they've got a fire at specific kremlins the the wanted one in particular um and and the lights go out and then the lights come on and you've you've got to um basically make sure you fire at the right one and your reflexes don't make you fire at the wrong one so it's it, it's a little bit more complicated than barrel of kremlins and therefore in my mind less satisfying but it's still an, a neat twist. And while yeah. I don't... Oh, sorry. No, uh, I was just going to say, I like the the vibe all of these kind of have of... I, I feel like they, they're they a bit like a really good, like, like Flash game. Uh-huh. That would come out around this time. Like, just a very satisfying little minigame experience. Yeah, I like, too, that it's... All, all revolving around, like, uh, take care of the Kremlin crew. Like, that's why I said it kind of serves as a nice epilogue to the game. Like, you can imagine Cranky being like, hey, we still have some reports of Kremlins lurking around the offshore islets. Donkey Kong, take your coconut gun and uh, and, <laughs> and take care of the problem. Quotation, finger quotes. Um <laughs> <laughs> and and that that whole epilogue vibe really comes to fruition with the last game, Galleon Gunner. And I said I liked uh, Buddies Beware and Barrel of Kremlins, but this is the most memorable one, at least for me. Where oh, for sure. It, it's the only time you're ever in sort of ship the ship combat with the gangplank galleon except you don't have a ship you just have your coconut gun but you you see the gangplank galleon's galley uh cannons coming out of the galleon there are six of them and it's being operated by k rule who's on the top deck and he's running around and basically you have to hit the cannons fire your coconuts in the cannons 
and you can't get hit by the cannons. I think you can only get hit four times, and then you're you're out. You're done. But yeah, this this whole thing is kind of like okay, oh, rule still on the gangplank galleon. Oh, I I guess I've got to take care of K rule here. Let me let me take my gun and and shoot his ship up. Um, but it's just it's it's fun. It gives us another look at the gangplank galleon. Yeah. And like the way it works is you're shooting the into the cannons that are about to fire at you. So I guess you're like kind of like 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 Bugs Bunny putting his finger in the barrel yeah, of the gun. That's exactly <laughs> what it is. Yeah. And it, it's just fun to see K Roll because you know, you don't see K Roll much in these games. He's there as the final boss. So to see him in another context is always a treat. Yeah, and it's always I like when you, whenever you see more of the gangplank galleon in a in a in a port or a remake or like a reframing of an adventure or a continuation, like seeing more of the gangplank galleon than you initially did, and this time we get like a a view of the side of it with the cannons, which doesn't I don't think it like tracks with how it actually looks in the rest of the game, but it's always interesting to see. The Gangplank Galleon, yeah, the Gangplank Galleon's always sort of been malleable, where it's always kind of retained this the basic shape, but sometimes you have to squint to to have it like correlate from appearance to appearance. But you know, it it's fine, it works, it's cool. Um, Andre says that uh, I don't remember any of these mini games. I think I did what Mitchell, referring to a uh, friend of the show, Mitchell Wolf, frequent co-host. Mitchell did when they played Kirby 64 for one of their old podcasts and almost didn't realize the mini games existed because they were tucked away in the options menu. And I forget that these are in the options menu because they are so memorable, especially Crosshair Cranky for me, that I, I always think like, oh, you beat the Gangplank Galleon and then you, you can access these uh, games. Like it, it, it expands the map to the left side, but that's not the case at all. It's just the way my brain has kind of put the pieces together. Yeah, there is a weird like cordoning off of this and funky fishing from the main game that, well, especially in comparison to how the GBA games handle it, where the, the mini games just are on the map screen. Yeah. Yeah. It's a shame that Crosshair Cranky didn't make the transition in any way to the GBA. I say I say it's a shame, but also I like that the GBC version has unique elements that set it apart. So I'm of two minds about it. Like, oh, it would be cool if Necky Nutmare was in there. It would be cool if Crosshair Cranky was in there. Just like Funky Fishing evolved into Funky's Fishing. But at the same time... I'm glad that this version hasn't been rendered totally redundant, you know? I'm I'm glad that there's a reason for people to seek it out, even if it will never be made commercially available by Nintendo again on any of their services. I say that hoping that, you know, maybe one day it will be, but I also know the way Nintendo operates. And it's it's Yeah, very there's unlikely. a there's a lot of holding out to even get the GBA games and if Getting the GBA games is a crapshoot. I don't have too much hope for this one. No, they're probably like, well, the Super Nintendo versions are available on uh, Nintendo Switch Online, so why would we need anything else? And, well, you need the other stuff because you want to experience this exclusive content, but I don't think they and Because care. there's just never going to be an all-in-one or Donkey Kong Country with all of the extra features combined. Right, right. Before we take the calls, Cameron, we, we do need to discuss one other element of this game that's unique to this version of Donkey Kong. Yes, Country. Um, this is this is the point where Steve can stop writing his five paragraph email berating <laughs> us for not mentioning this. It's been over two hours and they haven't discussed the rare cow yet. The most important thing in Donkey Kong Country for the Game Boy Color. Cameron, I will let you to, to explain to people because... I was shocked when I announced this episode. I th- I didn't think there would be this much interest in us doing a spotlight episode on Donkey Kong Country for Game Boy Color. I was wrong. I I was wrong. Like this is like the, the most anticipated episode we've done in quite a spell. And um I was like, "All, all right. So this might be some people's first ever conversation and maybe they are Donkey Kong fans." 
who never broaden their horizons out into the wider, rare output, you know, where, where maybe, maybe they aren't like rare diehards like we are. So they don't know what the rare cow is. And I want you to explain to the good people, what is the rare cow? <laughs> Well, the rare cow, as best I can explain it, because the rare cow is kind of inexplicable. <laughs> um, the rare cow is a recurring Easter egg from the the rare handheld team of a like very stylized, like almost, almost stick figure esque um, pixel art drawing of a cow. Mm-hmm. Um, I. I believe it I believe it its first appearance was in Vultureville and Conquer's Pocket Tales, where it represented actual cows that were standing around in the background. Yes, there there, there was more than one. There there were cows actually like being kept in Vultureville, grazing out in the desert. Yep, yeah, and for some reason this specifically took off as this recurring in joke with the team making all of these Game Boy Color and Game Boy Advance games. Um, like it shows up in Perfect Dark, um, Grunty's Revenge, yeah, several y- others, but it it shows up in this game. Yeah, usually it doesn't manifest as an actual cow. It, it, it's sometimes a drawing, sometimes graffiti. Um, in this case, I am not sure exactly what the cow is supposed to be because the cow appears in Slip Slide Ride in the background in the crystalline cave and i've seen it explained as oh it's cave art like a cave painting that is what i would imagine the case like this would be like a cave painting my my only question about that cameron is well it's an ice cavern so is it carved into the ice or could you make the case that it is a cow that had somehow stumbled onto Gorilla Glacier and got frozen in in the ice and like <laughs> cryogenically preserved? Either is very is very satisfying. Yeah, the the background is pretty abstract, just going to the level of detail. Yeah, yeah. I I'm sure Steve McCorkle, the expert on all things rare cow in the community. Uh, Steve, Steve would have his own opinions about the rare cow in Slip Slide Ride. I'm wondering, of course, I'm, I'm looking at the broader view of the series, and when the Tiki Tac tribe returned, when the volcano erupted and basically decimated Gorilla Glacier, if that was a frozen cow in there, did the cow's body get incinerated or did it thaw the cow out? And now there is a cow wandering around Donkey Kong Island. Um, we will probably never have that explained <laughs> because f- for many reasons, they will never touch that dangling plot thread. But I want you all to consider the very nature of the rare cow cave drawing cave painting or actual frozen cow and if an actual frozen cow where are they now i uh i'll 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 leave you to that um why don't we take some calls while we're pondering on the rare cow uh we, we got we got a few calls to take and and then i want to broach a broader continuity topic when it comes to this game i i think we're gonna have different opinions on it but uh i i think it'll be as mitchell would say a very spicy debate all right let's go ahead and take that first call Thank you for for the call. Um, I'm impressed that you have the lung capacity to whistle the entire wow. thing. Yeah. Um, I don't think I like. 
I can't even whistle right now. My my lips are either too wet or too dry. I'm, I'm one of those. I no no I'm not gonna I can't I can't do it. No, that's a that's an impressive uh, duration to keep that up. Yeah, and yeah. and it almost sounds like the uh, the 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 sound quality of <laughs> this game. <laughs> No, uh, we we haven't really spoken about the uh, the music, the um, the sound, ex- aside from using Grant's clips in Funky Fishing. What do you think about the music, uh, uh, the the rendition of everything, the Donkey Kong Country music in this game? Um, this game has a really pleasant sound to it. Um, I know that a lot of it is leaning on pre existing Donkey Kong Land compositions, but not all. Not but all. not all of it, and. In some of the places where they have to make concessions, I'm honestly very fine with it. Like, um, they they do an interesting thing where, like, obviously they can't do ambient tracks on the GBC without it sounding just, like, weird, not near silent, like, bloops and bleeps that don't really read as anything. Yeah. So they, they mix around some stuff, and... Uh, one particular arrangement I really like is that they move the they make an arrangement of slipside ride, but move it to um instead of using the Donkey Kong Land snow theme, they move it to Snow Barrel Blast. And in place of the slipslide ride theme, they use Kremlantis from Donkey Kong Land. Yeah, that's 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 right and it's the uh, the one time the Kremlantis theme which it, I think is I think held up as maybe everybody's favorite track from Donkey Kong Land, original track from Donkey Kong Land. Um it, it's the one time it really gets repurposed. Yeah, and it it, it creates this interesting vibe because now that the snow layering is gone and there's this uh, very, very like upbeat, peppy music paired with Snow Barrel Blast. It makes the level feel well, it, it completely flips the level tone on its head toward like whimsical and fanciful as opposed to stuck in the middle of a kill storm by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, I guess that that's the one Graham Norgate composition in this game. Like- um, well, they. There are a few re- reuses from Donkey Kong Land because there's the the voices of the temple music is, is oh, from it, Donkey it, Kong it, Land it, as yeah, well, it's isn't his it? Yeah, version. Even though the voices of the temple was just his take on the original, um, but I guess it's still the Graham Norgate version of that. I, I'm just and the that. and the cave cave dweller concerts a bit different as well. Yeah, and, yeah. I, I was thinking more in terms of original DKL music, like top to bottom original. Uh, but and uh, as far as original music for this game, I know a standout for a lot of people is the forest theme. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. This is actually like I I know I I like was I I'm more dismissive of the GBC sound chip. Like it 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 is what it is. But they do a really impressive job, I think, translating the music in a unique, interesting way. Obviously, you're like you said, you're never going to have the ambience and the. Um, the feels of the original DKC soundtrack, but they take it in an interesting way that it, it makes it unique and different and interesting in its own right. In a way that I think a lot of other dev teams would have stumbled and, and just had it be kind of a muddied out slog of a rendition of the yeah. soundtrack. I'm, I'm thinking oh. specifically like the credits theme which which is basically taking the credits theme from the original DKC and you know downgrading it, but they do do it in such a way that rather than losing something, you make it interesting in its own right. It, I can't really describe it without you hearing it, so maybe I will just play it right here so you can get a taste. Hold on.
All right. So yeah, it, it, it's 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 kind of a it's beautiful take. in a different way yeah. than the original is. Like they're both very um like ethereal and sort of like uh what what's the word? Not like they make you think back on the totality of everything you just went through. Yeah. Yeah, but but I and I think it's ways. also important because th- this game's credits are really freaking long. They are because they they have to get in. Well, I think they just credit the original DKC team and one fell swoop. They're like the original I, the original DKC team. I, done. If I remember right, like the bulk of the credits is because I think this was like a a cart that was like one size fits all for every region. Yeah, that the game was sold in. So they credit all in every individual regional branch of Nintendo. Yeah, like NOE France. At I, like by that point, you're like, wait, what? What? what, what? Okay, yeah, because also with the language, um, the language option, you select the language from the start, and and so it, it is like I I think you're right. It is one size fits all, and so it's um. Except for Japan, because Japan, this came out as Donkey Kong 2001. Um, came, came out the, the next year in Japan and it had a different title because the Donkey Kong Country <laughs> branding doesn't exist in Japan. Yeah. So they called it Donkey Kong recurring, recurring theme of the one window in time of which that makes sense again. Yeah, yeah. Where everything was branded with 2000 and 2001 and then it tapered off after that. Right. Which which must be really confusing. You're like, I played Donkey Kong 64. I played Donkey Kong 2001. Where's everything in between? I'm missing so many sequels. Let's go ahead and take our second call. Hi, this is Jack Levin. Um, I'm uh, I'm really excited that you guys are talking about Donkey Kong Country on the Game Boy Color. It's, uh, it's a game that was profoundly important to me. Uh, when I was a kid, I was uh, really addicted to Donkey Kong Country, but uh, we didn't own a copy of our own. My sister's best friend at the time had a copy, and every time she would come over to hang out with my sister, she would bring her copy to placate me, because uh, they knew if I was playing Donkey Kong Country all day, I wouldn't just be following them around, annoying them. Uh, you know how little brothers do. But uh, there, there ended up being a lot of things about this version that I kind of preferred. Uh, for one, the, the land soundtrack that they used for it is just really, really good. I think we can all agree on that. Uh, I also think that Neki Nutmare is an example of fantastic level design. It's a really good gimmick. It's, uh, it's a shame that it didn't make it into the GBA port. Um, speaking of which, I also strongly prefer this version of Funky Fishing over the GBA one. Uh, I think it's mainly because I, I enjoy the sound of, like, a really compressed Grant Kirkhope voice coming out of a Game Boy Color. Uh, and, uh, and like, the absolute gem of the whole experience for me is Crosshair Cranky. Uh, they actually found a way to incorporate the coconut gun into a Game Boy Color port, Donkey Kong Country. Uh, absolutely brilliant. Um, one thing that always bothered me about it, though, was that... Uh, you know how there's, like, multiple title screens that it cycles through instead of just one title screen, like on the SNES version? It's, like, a bunch of different bits of art, none of which are the title screen art from the SNES version. Uh, but when you open the game's manual, the page that shows the title screen has that SNES art. And I've always wondered what happened there. Did it get removed kind of late in development? I wonder if you guys uh, have some information about that. You can fill me in on. Because, uh, uh, yeah, it's just kind of been driving me crazy for a while but uh the only the only real detraction in this version you know the only thing missing that that truly hurts the experience overall i think we can all agree is that really really cool dance at the beginning of the snes version it's uh you know it's it's, it's a shame that we're missing that um the last thing i want to touch on is just uh i was just curious you know that art that it shows at the end of the credits of dk he's in like a bumper car or a roller coaster car something that like completely involves his torso I've never understood what the hell was supposed to be happening in that picture. When I look at that picture, my, my brain just malfunctions. So I was wondering if you guys know what is supposed to be happening there as well. But that's uh, that's all I have to say. I'm really looking forward to hearing this. I, uh, I adore you guys. Thanks so much. Uh, bye. Well, hey, thank you for the call, Jack. And I know I can answer the last question you had. I, I can't speak to why they didn't include the original... 
like rendered scene of Donkey and Diddy that that was seen at the beginning of the Super Nintendo version. Uh, why they didn't make the cut other than maybe they just wanted it, its own visual identity. I, I, I'm not sure. That's uh, kind of a revelation to me because I didn't remember that from the original manual. But no, I look at the look at it right now and it's there. Yeah, it's I guess maybe they didn't do it because, as you said, landing on their own visual identity, they might have decided to do the rotating title screens that slowly pan down. In which case, you can't really do that same scene. Right. Yeah, they they, they, they were selective. You had the underwater scene um, where you could pan down and, oh, there they are. You had the the one that this episode actually uses its key art for on YouTube and SoundCloud. The one of Donkey and Diddy in the mine with the anachronism of Donkey Kong wearing a miner's hat that he never wears in the actual game. Um, the idea that evolved into squawks eventually. And uh, there was the one with, I think, Winky, right, in the jungle. Yeah, it's Winky, Diddy, and Donkey hopping through the jungle. So maybe they felt like... Also the... something I don't think you really see is Winky in the jungle. Yeah, so maybe they uh, they thought that, that the, the original one would be too similar to that, and they just liked the way that looked hard to say i don't have yeah. any definite answers and and that art is in the game in some form because it's one of the printable stickers right you can do right so it feels like it was definitely rattling around but i have no idea why they made the choice they did unless it just they thought the vertical pan was stronger and didn't want to lose it yeah uh speaking to your last point uh i can tell you what that is that is donkey kong crawling out of a Game Boy Color Ringu style. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I remember having the same problem visually parsing that image. Yeah, yeah. Um, Like when I was a kid, I remember thinking like, oh, is is Donkey Kong resting in a hot tub after this game? (laughs) Like he's had a very long day. (laughs) Yeah, just needs to soak his feet for a little bit. Shades of Bachelor Bear, like... uh, (laughs) Here's Donkey Kong <laughs> lounging seductively in a hot tub. The end. Uh, no, it, it's uh, it's supposed to be like Donkey Kong's crawling out of your Game Boy Color coming to say, Hi, nice job. Thanks for saving my bananas. Come join me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually did a tweet about it. Uh, some time ago maybe you can find it rattling around on twitter but yeah i was like wow that's i i don't think like the horror of what it's actually depicting really uh registered with me back then until i like stumbled across the image um modern times and i'm like oh wow okay i don't think any of us would have really wanted to uh to have donkey kong climb out of our handheld and like try to grab us but e- even those who love donkey kong that would be a bridge too far just andre in the chat pointing out uh it, saying is that what inspired that donkey kong bath time game you played at that convention you hosted a panel at yeah this is kind of donkey kong bath time zero isn't it <laughs> yeah for those who aren't aware of, of donkey kong bath time donkey kong bath time was a uh a fan made, I guess, student project that was playable at MAGFest uh, 2020 in the uh, the last two months before the pandemic, you know, shuttered everything. Cameron and I hosted a DK Vine panel at MAGFest, and uh, the whole the whole show that year was kind of vaguely themed around Donkey Kong, and and somebody brought this. Uh, this interactive game called Donkey Kong Bath Time, where you got into a a kiddie pool and you basically got to wash yourself as if you were Donkey Kong. We have a well, we have a video on our YouTube channel of me doing it. Um, this is a very sexy time, very sexy time. Thank you for the call, and let's go ahead and play our last one. Hey, uh, my name is Jonathan. Uh, my online handle is Goblinaro. I was calling to leave my thoughts on the, uh, the Game Boy Color release of Donkey Kong Country. Um, I actually grew up with this title. I was born in 93, and I believe I got it for my birthday in May of 2001. Uh, 
back, I would say, a year prior, because uh, growing up, um, my family was uh, rather impoverished. We didn't get an N64 growing up, but we did have a, a Super Nintendo that we got from uh, from a relative for free as a hand-me-down. Now, at one point, one of my mother's fam- or friends rather had visited and had brought over Donkey Kong Country for the Super Nintendo, and in the six hours or so that she was there, I actually beat it entirely. Of course, I did it 100% it, but I got a K. Rule and beat him, and I thought it was the best game I'd ever played. At that point, I was obsessed with Donkey Kong for the next few years. Every time we would go to Blockbuster, I would rent uh, Donkey Kong Country, The Fiction of the Crystal Coconut. Drove my mom mad. But uh, when it came to my birthday uh, that year, I had wanted to get this game uh, for the Super Nintendo, but even at that point in 2001, it was sold out everywhere. Even back then, it was really popular. But instead, my mom got me Donkey Kong Country for the Game Boy Color. And while I was a little bit sad about that at first, having played it, I still fell in love with it all over. It was a little bit harder to play because the the aspect ratio of the square screen of the Game Boy Color does make platformers a bit more difficult. But overall, they did an incredible job moving a game from the Super Nintendo to a a system that's essentially on par with, with an NES. The music was mixed very well, although it, you know, the, the instruments and sound fonts used aren't as good. The, the actual tracks themselves sound really nice when you plug in some headphones and give them a real listen. Uh, and the visuals themselves, the fact that they were able to capture that same, the same magic that they used to create the visuals on the Super Nintendo with, you know, albeit an inferior color palette on the, the Game Boy Color was fantastic. I was really impressed playing it growing up. And then on top of that, they even threw in some additional mini games that weren't in the original, like the fishing mini game. I remember in long car trips, I would just play that for hours on end at times whenever I was really bored. Uh, the performance-wise, it, it did have some trouble, but honestly back then in gaming, it wasn't really uncommon for some big releases to, to have the performance issues that this game did. Uh, one parallel I like to, to think of is Thunder Force 4 uh, for the Sega Genesis. Both of those games really pushed the boundaries of visuals on their respective consoles, but they also both suffer from slowdown when there are too many sprites on the screen, as well as sprites also being unloaded when too many populate the screen. That is something that didn't happen too often in the Game Boy release of, uh, of Donkey Kong Country. And they took it to the limit. Yeah, they hit the three-minute mark and cut off. But thank you so much for the call. And yeah, just an, right. another another instance of this game being somebody's primary Donkey Kong Country experience. Yeah, it's it's something that's easy to ignore again now in an age where everything is extremely accessible, but it, it can't be understated the importance of just having even if they weren't completely perfect Donkey Kong Country available in some form two people in I that's that's why we have so many like fans who grew up on the GBA versions it's, right. it it doesn't matter if it's not the ideal way to play the game it's a way to play the game you you get a new audience that way and back in that day we didn't have a a virtual console service or a Nintendo Switch online to get the game in everybody's hands and I oh god I went full Oh, cranky. <laughs> well, that that raises the question um, because knowing what we know now, was Donkey Kong Country for the Game Boy Color actually something of a missed opportunity? And, and I, I I say that with some trepidation because we just established that this was a lot of people's. Or, or at least a healthy amount of people's primary either on introduction to Donkey Kong Country or the, the way they played Donkey Kong Country the most. But let, let's look at the timetable. This game came out in November of 2000. In less than two years after its release, Microsoft would purchase Rare after Nintendo declined to do the same. And so if Rare knew what we know now, with that time ticking, 
on their ability to contribute new entries to the Donkey Kong franchise, would they have actually just done a remake of Donkey Kong Country, especially when that would be what they were locked into from 2003 through 2007, from Donkey Kong Country GBA to Diddy Kong Racing DS, or would they actually try to make a true Donkey Kong Land-style handheld follow-up to Donkey Kong 64? Or would the scale of that task be too too much compared to just remaking a game that had already been done and getting it on store shelves in time for the holiday season. What do you, what yeah, do you think? Again, this is why, this is part of why I have so many unanswered, like, like burning unanswered questions about why this game exists. But I do think in the specific window it came out in, I have a hard time imagining a, a, one rare putting together a wholly original Donkey Kong Country experience on the Game Boy Color, like original assets, music, level design, and all, and also getting it, it getting getting a return on that investment because it would have to be done before the the Game Boy Color started to go on its way out, which uh, the clock was ticking at this point. Yeah, like and, I. And, like, you, you could say, well, maybe they could wait a little bit and, like, intend to make it a launch title for the game or launch window title for the Game Boy Advance. But then is that going to pull F, pull resources off of their Game Boy Advance output that they're already kicking around at that point? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like I said, no, not knowing the timetable, it's easy for us as sort of these armchair quarterbacks of what Rare has done and continues to do. To be like, well, Rare, uh, that was great and all, but you really should have made Donkey Kong Land 4. You didn't really <laughs> think that one through. It's easy for us to say that, but looking at actually how things progressed, it might have just been like, hey, we could do this. Have a game that is out for the holidays. Has a high yield return investment because we didn't have to put in a lot of time for a game that's fundamentally already done. We just have to, you know... <laughs> make it work on the Game Boy and Color. And it's going to sell because it's Donkey Kong Country. Right. So that that is all well and good. But knowing that the only other Donkey Kong games that Rare would actually be able to release from that point on would be Donkey Kong Country remakes and then Diddy Kong Racing remake, it, it does sort of represent a, oh, if only they had known, if only they had been able to say, hey, we're going to do a new Donkey Kong game for the Game Boy Color that sort of actually broadly incorporates elements introduced in DK64. Like, could you imagine a Donkey Kong Land where it's lanky and chunky and tiny as the playable cast? You know, like, that would have been cool. Uh, and, and again, this is just me, again, armchair quarterback. I don't envy the task of somebody having to translate Lanky's character design <laughs> to three colors. <laughs> yeah, I I know, and and it's it's all, like I would have even just loved a new Donkey Kong Land style game with Donkey and Diddy. You know, like you don't even need to go the full tie in with DK sixty four route. Um, and and that's just in hindsight. You know, back back then it was like okay, whatever. We're gonna get Donkey Kong Country, or we're gonna get Donkey Kong Coconut Crackers. We're gonna get Diddy Kong Pilot. You know that that was all announced about yeah, six it's... months after this came out. It's like the the rug was pulled out from the people working on these games just as it was pulled out for us. Like there wasn't time to see what was coming down the coming down the tunnel. I'm sure the stampers were already like mulling about what they were going to do, where they were yeah. going to go next. Like I, I'm, I'm sure that was in the conversation, but I'm also sure the conversation is no, we're we're going to like we'll be bought out, but we'll have somebody take our shares and we'll be a multi-platform studio. Yeah. Nintendo will still have us handling Donkey Kong for the foreseeable future. Yeah, like, like, and especially among, like, the rank and file people at Rare. Like, I, I don't know how privy they were to what the Stampers' broader plans were at this time and what that timetable was looking like and how it would all shake out. Because at this point, I'm sure they're still, still thinking, like, yeah, we'll be with Nintendo or our relationship with Nintendo will continue no matter what. And, and also, most of these teams, if they weren't working on Donkey Kong projects, it wasn't going to change that much. Right, right. So, in theory, you know, it, looking at it from the 
uber Donkey Kong fan perspective, you can be like, oh, you really missed opportunity there, Rare, to give us an- one more new Donkey Kong game before you couldn't. Great job. Good going. <laughs> but in a historical context, there is no way to know. And, and yeah, we, we could all wish we could get that time machine and, and we... If we if we go with you know back to the future style time travel actually change the past, but as we've just heard from our calls, as we've just discussed, this game was still fundamentally important to people, right? And it it was I've said you know every Donkey Kong game is uh, is somebody's first Donkey Kong game. We've seen that even with things like when I was at Magfest, I had people approach me and talked about how much Jungle Climber meant to them because it was their first Donkey Kong game. This was no different, and I'm glad it existed as it did. However, hmm, it does exist as it did, and that includes all of the references to Donkey Kong 64. So, Cameron... I end things by asking you. <laughs> oh, no. Obviously, DK Vine's perspective on the GBA remakes is that they are the same adventures as the Super Nintendo. We are just privy to new events that we had not seen beforehand. Like, yes, at one point during Donkey Kong Country 2, a bunch of zingers flew back to Donkey Kong Island and abducted Dixie's kid sister who up until that point had not been involved in any of the adventures and and that happened in 1995 we just never saw it when we played the original super nintendo version and if any instances where the the games conflict with one another uh the super nintendo one will always win out as the true canonical interpretation but that doesn't lessen the gba versions like yes cranky was racing espresso in underground ostrich racing on crocodile isle that was always happening that is canon so those are our <laughs> ways of viewing the gba remix donkey Kong country for the game boy color in, uh, is an interesting conundrum though because it is another remake on top of all of that and you we could just say yeah all three coexist whatever can candy was operating a dance studio and this challenge and, and and whatever but there are elements in the game boy color version that might actually conflict with the canon there's a reason dk vine argues that diddy kong racing ds takes place in 2007 and isn't just a reinterpretation of the events that happened in 1997 because tiny kong has been aged up among other things so, does Donkey Kong Country's Game Boy Color's use of the coconut gun and the heavy embrace of visual aesthetics of Donkey Kong 64 suggest that it's actually a new adventure? It's just K. Roll repeating his old plot, but it's a new adventure that takes place in November 2000, concurrently with the events of Banjo-Tooie, by the way. So maybe this is explains why the Kongs didn't care about this life-sucking energy machine that Gruntilda is using. That would theoretically, you know, imperil the entire rare archipelago. Let's be real here. This should be an all-hands-on-deck emergency. You know, I don't care if the Kongs have never fought Gruntilda before. Everybody should be coalescing around the Isle Hags, just like they did on Timbers Island a couple years earlier. But I digress. The... Is this the reason why the Kongs were occupied during that time? And would this then bring things full circle in the rare Donkey Kong story? It started with the banana horde theft. It ended with an identical banana horde theft. And and from there, the story is wrapped up on Rare's terms. Could you possibly interpret it as that? I I guess you could. I'm not going to stop you. This has been a File 2 production. Terrico.